Let me welcome you this morning to today's user experience track event of the New York Technology Council. Delighted to have you here. Uh, this is the third of our series on user experience. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, particularly our platinum sponsors, uh, Eisner Amper, Google, PowerSpace, and Ernst & Young. Uh, we are a nonprofit funded entirely by our sponsors, members, and uh, what we take in at the door. And so uh, we appreciate all of your support. And so with that, let me turn it over to Charles Morrow. Charles uh, runs the user experience track, and uh, we're gr very grateful for the great panels he's been putting together for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out this morning. This is the first time we've done a uh, early morning session. Um, and we're actually going to be um, uh, our next session will be an evening session, uh, and then we have a uh, probably a full day session planned for the fall, uh, which should be, uh, I think, very interesting. Okay, so a little bit about today's session. Uh, the schedule, we're going to have a brief introduction. That's what we're in now. Um, our first presentation is by uh, Bill Albert. Uh, we'll have a copy, uh, coffee break uh, uh, after the first. Uh, then we'll uh, it'll be followed by uh, Mark Resnick. And uh, then questions and comments, sort of an informal panel discussion at the end to go over these topics. Uh, these, um, the, the content that we're going to be dealing with today is, uh, is somewhat, uh, is, is actually quite a bit more advanced in terms of its impact on user experience design. So we expect to have an interesting uh, panel uh, discussion uh, right at the end. So we'll wrap up right around 1130. Uh, and you'll receive a follow-up survey in the email. Please uh, fill out that survey. It helps us a great deal, uh, especially with respect to uh, the acceptability of these morning sessions. Okay, so a very uh, quick uh, run here on the genesis of the topic uh, today. Um, about a year ago, I was asked by Eric to uh, put together this UX series for uh, the uh, Tech Council here in New York. And uh, the idea that uh, I put forth with the board was um, a series of sessions that would be, um, that would represent a, sort of a deeper look into the uh, science and the uh, development of UX uh, as a professional discipline. And so over the, uh, these first three sessions, uh, we've covered, um, uh, the first one was uh, on intellectual property. I don't know how many of you attended that session. Uh, it turned out to be a great session. We had leading IP attorneys from Chicago and New York uh, talking about protecting your UX. Uh, then we did uh, a session last month on judging UX. Uh, we have an excellent video up on uh, YouTube discussing uh, specific methodologies around user testing. This relates mostly to what this first or the last session was uh, dealt with, what you can observe from the standpoint of uh, uh, observing uh, users interacting with a system from a research point of view. Uh, today's session, however, looks uh, much more uh, deeply into the actual mind of the user. And we know from cognitive science, this is a, a much more complex uh, set of issues. But uh, as we work through the uh, sort of the more advanced forms of cognitive science research today, we see that these uh, sort of sub-second or very rapid um, cognitive processes that are taking place are actually having a much larger impact on the success of UX design than anyone had thought previously. So today we're going to do a deeper dive into the uh, actual cognitive processes around what uh, users are thinking. Uh, and then we have a session coming up in, uh, Jan in uh, July, which Eric mentioned briefly. Um, we're very fortunate to have Bonnie John. She was uh, previously a professor at Carnegie Mellon, uh, led their user experience design group. And um, she will be talking about cognitive modeling processes. And uh, this is a uh, well-known area in the field of, of human factors engineering, but it's just finding its place in formal user uh, experience design. Uh, she's a terrific speaker. She's now at IBM. Okay, so our first uh, speaker is uh, Bill Alpert. Um, I've known Bill for quite a few years. Uh, he's written a couple of uh, very uh, important books, uh, specifically this book, uh, Measuring the User Experience. It's, it's sort of the seminal work in uh, usability testing. So um, if, you have, uh, if you don't have this book on your bookshelf, uh, it's uh, definitely worth uh, uh, taking a look at and, and having uh, available. Uh, he's an adjunct professor at uh, Bentley College. He teaches human factors, engineering, and information design. And his primary focus is on advanced uh, user experience uh, testing. Uh, his professional experience includes extensive work uh, in the financial services industry. I think you were previously head of UX for Fidelity. Is that correct? Yeah. 
Um, and he's obviously the author of a number of important texts. Uh, he earned his PhD from Boston University. So uh, today uh, we're going to hear um, his talk, um, How Quick Are We to Judge? A Case Study of Trust in Website Design. So, Bill, thank you. All right, well, um, a, f a few thank yous. Um, thanks to NITEC for uh, inviting me here, to Charles uh, for setting all this up, uh, <clears throat> and all of you for, for coming this morning. Um, this is, I think, a really interesting session uh, because it's, it's certainly a real passion of mine. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, is um, trust as it relates to web design, but particularly around what I call pre-attentive processing or how basically how quick we are to make judgments about um, trustworthiness. Um, so what I want to do is, here's a, a, a agenda, so um, just give a brief background, who I am, why this interests me, and then talk kind of higher level around um, trust and web design. Uh, and then kind of bring that into a discussion around pre-attentive processing and how it relates to, to trust specifically. And then I want to share some results of uh, research that another professor at Bentley, um, Bill Gribbons, and I did um, related to this topic. And then bring it back up to things that are more practical about what it means for you, what you can do about it. Um, and then have a, a discussion for the, about the last 15 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> so. A little bit about me, I, you gave me a nice uh, introduction there, um, but things maybe on a more personal level. Um, I love the science behind the user experience. Um, I'm not a designer per se, but um, I'm really interested in what's going on perceptually, cognitively, as people are using products and how it affects their behavior. Uh, also, you can probably tell from my, the books that I've written, I'm a really data-driven person. Um, I certainly have um, gut feelings about what might work or what might not work, but uh, ultimately uh, uh, I'm a quant guy and I like to see data. Um, and I really like to create connections between research and practice. In fact, um, the center I'm leading at Bentley, the Design and Usability Center, is all about working with uh, companies and bringing to bear a lot of the research and how we can uh, provide a little bit more um, rigor uh, behind uh, user experience design. So this is really things that really uh, motivate me from a very high level. Um, just a, a bit of background about our, our center um, and, and I think understanding this will kind of help um, see kind of the perspective I'm taking on this. Um, we've been around for I guess about 13 years now and we're an independent center that's part of the um, uh, HFID, Human Factors and Information Design Program at Bentley, which is part of the Graduate School of Business. So we're really, um, like Charles was saying, kind of trying to bring together uh, user experience and business um, in, in this context. And we have a dual mission. We support um, the university. We work with external clients doing research for them, but also educate our graduate students in the process. We're almost like a teaching hospital for uh, user experience. Um, and we've worked with a lot of different clients, particularly in financial services. Um, so what is my motivation for this? Um, it's really two things. One is when I think about user experience, um, and what matters, it's trust. If you don't have trust, you have nothing. You, you cannot sell your product, you've got no loyalty, um, you're going to have high support costs, you're going to lose your user base, all that. Trust is really ultimately at the foundation of user experience. Um, and what I want to talk about today is that normally when we think of trust, we think of uh, something that we might form an opinion about whether something is trustworthy or not over an extended period of time after you've talked to somebody or spent some time on a website. But what I'm going to argue is that trust is not always conscious. Trust opinions can happen very, very quickly without us even being aware of them. And, and that's really kind of the crux of um, what I want to show today. And, and for this reason, this is what I find 
very interesting. There's, and I'll show later, there's a lot of research, um, more and more research that's showing um, more information is taken pre-attentively or pre-consciously than um, a lot of people uh, first thought. So um, trust in web design. Um, so um, do you trust this person right here looking at this image? Okay, this is a uh, this is actually some work from um, uh, from Princeton looking at how you generate um, uh, trustworthiness or characteristics of trustworthinesses and faces. Um, what about same image? This a, do you trust him there on on the right? The yeah, quite a quite a difference there. Um, and let me just show if 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 this does work here, um, a link to uh, some of the a video that shows how trustworthiness here can change over time. When it gets down to plus eight is the most trustworthy and zero is ba baseline and negative eight would be the least trustworthy face. So you can see that there's certain Some really interesting research, specifically, what are the what are the different elements? You can see um, certainly the curvature of um, the mouth, the the eyebrows, the no, the shape of the nose is a little bit different, um, and and really the question is is what what are these specific elements and how they work together to let you know. You know, if I saw this guy walking down the street, I might cross over to the other side, or this person I might say hello to. You know, and what I want you to think about is is how how does this translate into design, and what are the specific elements in design that um, might promote or take away from your level of trust? And it's really about these really small things that can make. Uh, a big difference, especially when they're working in concert with one another. So, um, do you trust this website right here? <laughs> and, you know, all of us have like this quick visceral reaction to it. I mean, there's, you might say, well, maybe not the best color choice, uh, <laughs> some of the tone, you know, you know dollar sign for, you know, the letter S, all these different things uh, would probably make us uh, quickly click off of this website. What about this? This is a, you've got this site basically screaming at you, explanation, ex exclamation points, um, you know, no fees, no blah, 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 all this stuff together really does, um, hopefully, I would imagine, uh, suggest maybe not the most trustworthy site that you've ever seen, right? And, and really the idea is how do, you, how do you kind of dissect or identify those different issues or these elements that are really um, affecting your level of trust? Now, let's look at it a different way. What about this site? American Cancer Society, do you trust it, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, certainly a strong brand recognition, um, but you can see the design is so different. It doesn't have, the people don't have the same reaction to it, um, like maybe those other two sites that I showed you. Things around the contact information, a phone number, affiliations, all these different things together are helping um, promote some certain level of, of trust. Um, or Mint. Right, I'm fascinated by mint. Um, not only because it's 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 a um, really elegant design, I think, but how do you get people to basically give you all their account information for all their financial information? I mean, for those of you that don't know, this is kind of an aggregator of financial data, and it does some really nifty things, helping you uh, budget and and. Um, figure out kind of overall what your portfolio looks like, how it's doing. 
Um, I would just be fascinated to know what those initial conversations were like. Like, okay, this is going to be um, our company. This is what we want to do. We think we can do it from a technological standpoint. But how do we actually get people to give us all this information so we can go grab all that data from their, their different accounts? Trust is, if they don't have trust, they don't have a company. It's all built on trust. So um, I'm... You know, I'm I'm fascinated by Mint. I think it's it's a it's a great example of a company that can really build build trust. Um, now, what does trust with technology look like? Can, at least at a high level. Um, so, a system or design or product or whatever you want to call it needs to react in some kind of reliable or predictable way. There ca there can't be any surprises. The more surprises there are usually the less the trust. Um, it has to be transparent about the intentions and the goals. So you have to understand what, what is it, what are they after, right? What are they trying to do or how are they trying to help you? If there's a bit of a, um, a mystery about what they're doing or why they exist or how, what the value proposition is, people start second guessing the, 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 um, the, the organization. Um, certainly probably, goes without saying, but I think it's important to, to note, you can't take advantage of the user. And this can, it's not like we want to steal all your money, but this can play out in different ways of, um, you know, what your default selections are, or using um, opt-in, uh, or opt-out as an example in a form. All this is about taking advantage of users. Um, it needs to be truthful, needs to deliver promises, so if you're through your SEO or SEM efforts, you're trying to bring people to your site. Um, you need to deliver whatever it is that you're you're saying you're marketing, um, and and sometimes there can be a bait and switch, and usually that means people are upset and they leave and they don't trust you anymore. Um, and then the last point here is, in order for trust to take place, there there has to be some element of risk on behalf of the user. So if I've got nothing to lose at all, there really isn't, there's very little in the way that trust kind of applies, right? So there has to be at least some risk involved, whether it's losing data or being put on an email list or anything that would have kind of a negative repercussion on me. Uh, so what I want to do now is look at specific elements about the impact of trust. Um, so uh, in our center, we've got, we've got graduate students that work with us. And um, uh, just this last week, one of our students, I said, can you find me some really bad websites? Uh, and she did a fantastic job, I think. Um, this is real. This is a current member of Congress, um, George Hutchins um, from North Carolina. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, okay. There's different um, elements of trust, and I've kind of dissected it down to what I think are kind of 10 really important pieces. The first is content, okay? So certainly the tone that you have, um, the tone would be, um, you know, are you taking a, a business casual approach or something more formal? In fact, we've done tone studies to look at how people respond to different, different types of tone in the content itself. Um, the relevance of the information, how timely it is. You know, if you've got a lot of out-of-date content, again, not as trustworthy. Typos um, will kill you. A single typo, all of a sudden your perceived trustworthiness goes down. Um, what was interesting about this is when I first saw this, um, because this site is so bad, and the font that he had, he had um, the N and the H look so s similar, I thought he had misspelled Stonehenge, and it said Stonehenge. And I was like, oh my God, how did, how did he get away with that? But once I, I looked at it again, I thought, okay, he did spell it correctly, but even the perception of a typo, I guess, can hurt you. Um, and also the clarity, the terms that use the labeling um, and, and just the, the clarity. The content is so important in terms of conveying trust. Um, consistency. 
Um, and I look at consistency on two levels. The visual consistency, uh, th this is a great example of a site that may not be so visually consistent. Um, and the interaction, so how navigation works or how forms work. Any kind of the interaction about how the user is interacting with the website needs to work in a consistent, very predictable way. A uh, color. Um, and this is actually, um, you'll see later, is, is a really important element in trust, particularly with um, certain, in certain industries, people have expectations, having a, a purple text on um, a black background, maybe not the best color palette choice, um, but certainly color in of just it itself has um, a big impact. Um, and the layout, how the site, how a page is laid out, uh, in terms of the density of information, if I can just, you only seeing one small piece of this website, so you can see um, okay, maybe that's not. Uh, It's, it's a, okay, it's a long, long, horrible site. <laughs> uh, and, and the amount of white space is so, it's so limited. Um, it's just, you're going to have to look at something pleasant after that. Um, ju just politics aside, just the site. Um, so some other elements that impact trust. Um, specific design elements, the buttons, links, the calls to action. Are you using standard conventions? Are you trying to be really cute? Are you trying to um, uh, scream at the people through the, the treatment of, of visual treatment of specific buttons or links? Um, the images that you're using, are they um, well placed or are they gratuitous? Do you need them or don't you need them? Um, and certainly all the things around the visual treatment of the design elements has, um, has an impact. Um, the sixth point is around changing behavior. So people like to think that they are, you know, they have free will about what they click on, and sometimes sites will try to steer behavior in a certain direction. Um, things like default selections. Um, are you putting people into a higher bracket when they're buying something and they need to opt out of it, or signing them up for a newsletter and they have to uncheck it, they have to opt out. Um, and visual prominence, are you really trying to steer people through, you know, whether it's making something really prominent or even uh, de-emphasizing important information. So it's all about are you trying to manipulate behavior in a somewhat deceptive way that can really undermine trust very quickly. Um, ads, um, certainly the type of ad, especially animated ads. Um, you know, just from a, a perceptual cognitive point of view, we, we can't, as humans, we can't um, not look at something that's moving that's how we're hardwired. And when you have something animated, you're forcing attention there. It works from an eyeball standpoint, but it can really undermine not only satisfaction with the site, but also trust. So that has to be done very carefully. The location, the content of the ads as well. Um, and this is also a great, um, go to linkscars.com if you want to see uh, an absolutely over the top uh, website. Um, and then the last three elements that really impact trust. Um, contact information, so having the clarity of information, um, really being able to understand it quickly. The ease of use, being able to um, easily find information and the comprehensiveness of it. Not just showing uh, an email address, but sometimes having a phone number. Knowing who to contact is huge. If, if you're trying to hide who you are and there's just a P.O. box, that's not always so good. Um, the ninth point is around community. Uh, it's really important to, in order to build trust, is to show how your, your site or your organization fits into a larger community. And this would be done through real photos, uh, not just a series of stock images like what's over on the right. Um, um, testimonials from real users that are not always five star. Um, and seeing affiliations, seeing who, 
who also backs up the site. And um, in fact, the, the screenshot on the right here is, is something that um, uh, our group participated in a few weeks ago called the Boston Biz Lab. I didn't know anything about us. They invited us to this conference in Boston to talk about um, or to give demonstrations around eye tracking. And it was through kind of a loose connection. And when we were planning for this conference, they said, yes, we're, we're expecting um, 2,000 people there. It's at the Heinz Convention Center, a big place. OK, yeah, we'll go there. We'll give eye tracking demos. Won't co cost us anything. It's local. Um, I didn't hear anything. It seemed very poorly organized. And they said, no, we've got 1,000 people registered. OK, that's great. We show up on the day, and um, there's 35 people at this conference. And there was so much about, I probably should have trusted my gut, but even their website with, you know, stock images, very little content. Um, and I was just shocked. It, I was not the only upset one. Um, but it's, there are subtle things about, about this image or this design that may, made some at least yellow lights go off. So I, okay, maybe I need to take a closer look at this. Um, and then the last point is around logo brand company is also um, certainly really important. And that it's called kind of more uh, the reputation that a company has kind of beyond their technology. But you see American Cancer Society, okay, yeah, they're well established, but maybe not Boston Biz Lab, for example. Um, I want to just kind of um, make a shout out to some really good work that's done uh, by BJ Fogg at the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. Um, and he's done a lot of work over the years on trust and credibility. And what I like about this is that he, he talks about trust as one element. Um, in fact, he talks about trustworthiness plus expertise is equal to credibility. So trustworthiness, all those things are basically, is the site or the system working kind of, are they benevolent? Are they working in my best interest? Um, mm -hmm. And then there's expertise, right? And expertise is around your knowledge, your domain, domain um, knowledge about something. So for example, maybe a used car salesman would be lower on the trust factor, but maybe higher on the expertise because they're in the industry and they might have lower credibility. My mother, wonderful lady, I completely trust her, but she's got no expertise with cars. So again, not very credible. So it's really the, the combination of trustworthiness plus an expertise that equals credibility. And he talks about four different levels of credibility. Presumed credibility, which is what you'd um, kind of have going into some interaction with a system. Um, a reputed credibility based on those affiliations and other people that would support it. Surface, which is really what I'm going to start to talk more in depth about, is surface credibility is based on kind of a, uh, a short-term immediate inspection almost of um, a website. And then earn credibility, which is credibility that is established over time, right? So multiple interactions with, for example, a website, you might establish some level of kind of earned credibility. Um, so some questions that we, I want to answer ab about or address around trust and design is, first is, how do we begin to form opinions? Or what, sorry, when do we begin to form opinions about trust? Is it something that happens in a couple seconds, a couple minutes, or less? Okay. So when does those when do those formations begin? And then how dynamic is trust? Is trust something that uh, is really malleable that um, I could meet somebody and trust them and then not trust them, or vice versa? How flexible is this whole kind of construct of trust? And then are there De uh, design primitives that impact trust. So I talked about kind of different specific elements, but are there certain primitives around color and layout and information density um, that working separate or together on a really primitive level that is impacting our opinions of trust, okay? So um, now I want to kind of shift gears and talk about pre-attentive processing and why this, um, how this fits in. 
So what is it? it it's basically um, cognitively, it's something that kind of comes before, precedes, would call focused attention. It's something that is effortless, it's automatic, we all do it all the time. Um, we're basically taking in information pre-consciously and then um, basically it's acting as a filter and we're just able to focus on what's most important. Usually this happens um, very quickly, um, less than 200 milliseconds or two tenths of a second. Um, and there's kind of features that we can process pre-attentively. Um, like colors, closure, contrast. So um, this image over here on, on the left, you see if I asked you, find the red dot. I, hopefully most of you can see the red dot. Um, and that would be something that is automatic. I could add a bunch more blue dots next to it and you're still gonna be able to do it with equal ease um, almost automatically. Um, over on the right, there's a red, the red dot with the red squares. That takes a little longer. That's an, probably an example of um, something that is more effortful, that isn't pre-attentive, right? And it's really around the, um, the relationship between the circle and the square. I could make that circle way bigger, and you're, it's going to pop for you. It's going to become uh, an automatic process. And what, what we're finding now in the, in, in the research is that there's some elements specifically about faces, because there's always a lot of research on, on, on faces, is that some elements of faces um, are judged pre-attentively, like attractiveness. So you can see f faces for 50 millisecond, one 20th of a second, and be able to judge the attractiveness of it, um, or the trustworthiness of a face, like what I showed you. Uh, and I just found a paper this past weekend on sexual orientation of men. They showed in this study um, um, images of men who, um, and people had to guess uh, their sexual orientation. Or one twentieth, one twentieth of a second is almost a flash of light. You you can't pick out any particular element. And people were better better than chance at doing it in one one twentieth or fifty milliseconds. So. There's certainly, there's, there's elements around faces that people are gathering. And if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, it kind of makes sense. We need to very quickly and hardwired decide, you know, is this person friend or foe? Or how, how, do, I, how do I rate relate to this person very, very quickly just for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so the, the work that we actually based our work off of, or at least really largely informed, was um, work done by uh, Gitti Lingard and, and her colleagues at Carleton University in Ottawa. And they wanted to know, um, could people judge the attractiveness, visual appeal of websites pre-attentively, right? Or how long does it take to form an opinion about visual appeal? Um, and here's um, an example of a very poorly designed uh, website that you'd think would score very low on visual appeal. Here is another one that scored very low on visual appeal. Um, here's one that actually scored higher on visual appeal. And here's another one that scored higher as well. So um, let me tell you about what they did and why this is important. Um, they ran a series of experiments um, where they would show um, different web pages to their participants. Experiment one, people judged the attractiveness of a hundred different web pages, some more visually appealing, some less visually appealing, and they judged it in two phases, but they had a half a second to judge each, and they found that people were very consistent. The data were highly correlated in how they were judging um, um, the web pages in two different phases, okay? Not very surprising, a half a second seemed to be plenty of time to decide whether something was attractive or visually appealing or not. Um, then what they did in experiment two is that they, they took out, f isolated 50, 50 of those 100 that were most and least visually appealing, and they also wanted to look at other dimensions of visual attractiveness, like um, whether it was boring or interesting or, um, uh, good use of color, bad use of color, different, different aspects. Um, and then they ran the same thing and they, they found the same result, that people were very consistent in how they were judging the um, attractiveness at 500 milliseconds. 
Uh, and then experiment three, which is really the crux of it, is they put people in two different groups. They put people into a five, 50 millisecond or 500 millisecond group. Um, <clears throat> and they found that people in both groups were equally consistent about how they rated the pages uh, between one phase and another phase. So in other words, even at 50 milliseconds, they were judging the attractiveness. They got something almost from a flash of light, whether it was visually appealing or not, just like the people in the 500 or half a second condition. Um, so what they conclude is that people can form reliable, consistent opinions about the visual appeal only after a very, very brief exposure to it. There's something that happens very, very quickly where you can tell good, bad, good, bad. Um, and this is really, again, the foundation of kind of how we built out our, our research. So what did we do? Um, so again, this is based on uh, um, uh, a paper that uh, Bill Gribbins and I did uh, a couple years ago uh, that we presented or uh, published with uh, uh, HFES, Human Factors Ergonomic Society. And our question was, does trust form on a pre-attentive level? Can people judge or form an opinion about trust pre-attentively? Um, we saw that Lingard showed visual appeal can, but what about trust? Uh, normally we think about trust as something that happens over the longer term. Um, we had 72 people in our study, and we did it uh, online using a tool, and we had people um, uh, in the US and a few other countries and we compensated people and it, we got the data. And we wanted to look at um, specifically financial and healthcare websites. And unlike Lingard, who basically took a wide variety of websites, we wanted to take the top 25 financial services and the top 25 healthcare websites. So these are all Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies um, that you would think would have um, uh, at least uh, a certain amount of resources to, to professionally design their sites. And certainly financial health care are built on trust, right? Um, and that's why we took those, those domains. Um, in our study we had, um, um, of those uh, 50 websites, each person um, rated trust on uh, the same screenshot in two different trials. So they'd go through 50 and they'd be rating the trust and then they'd see the other, the the same 50 again randomized um, in a second trial. And this is what it looked like from a procedural story the point of view. So they would see a screenshot for 50 milliseconds, again, just a, almost just more than a flash of light. Then they would get a mask. A mask is basically uh, black and white static because we want to make sure that we weren't measuring their um, uh, kind of carryover effect in the image in their mind. We wanted to kind of wipe that out. Um, they would have a blank screen for a second, and then they would have a test assessment, and they could have up to 10 seconds to rate the trustworthiness of that. And we'd say, and this was kind of a challenging thing to get across, just as a gut feel, rate your trust, your, your trustworthiness of this site, right? And, and people were like, we gave them some practices, but it, it really was hard for people to get around this idea that you could rate a trustworthiness based on such a brief exposure. And then get another blank screen, and then they'd start the process over and cycle through and maybe 15 minutes long or something like that. So that's the procedure that we used in our experiment. And this is what we found. Um, we found a significant correlation between the average trust assessments in trials one and two. So um, each of those dots represents one of the hundred websites that we tested. And you can see some, some sites down here um, um, on trial one scored low. Um, in trial two, they scored low. And generally, uh, you can see a, a really nice um, uh, correlation um, with those websites. In other words, people were being really consistent about how they were um, judging trust from one to another. They couldn't even recognize the site. And oftentimes they didn't even know if they were the same or different. But there was something going on where they were responding just instinctively the same from one trial to the next. Okay. Normally I don't see an R value of 0.81 in 
in social studies, but or social sciences, it's it's um, very very high, very high. So we were really um, thrilled about this, um, um, and we wanted to look at it by participant. So we had. Um, Basically, 50 or just under 50 percent of the people exhibited a significant correlation in the trust assessments. So half of the people were extremely consistent, above, essentially above chance, um, in their ratings from one site to the other. So this is just a breakdown, probably more data than you'd want to see, but a breakdown of what their R values were um, for each of the participants. Um, we ran a second experiment because we were we were wondering, well, maybe people just started getting bored with the study and they because this is all online, they started clicking five, I trust it, I trust it, I trust it, in which case the data is going to come out highly correlated, um, even though, but we did see that spread. We we're like, huh, um, let's just be able to control for that, that what we'd call satisfying behavior. Um, so we conducted another experiment and we did it in the classroom. Um, so we used the same exact procedure as experiment one and we had 11 people, all grad students um, at Bentley and found a very similar pattern of results. Um, a significant correlation in the trust assessments between trials one and two. Um, so you can see generally a really nice um, pattern there <clears throat> and found specifically seven out of the 11 people um, they're exhibited a significant correlation in their trust assessments. So not everybody, but at least a majority of people seem to be very consistent to be able to to judge or perceive trustworthiness on a pre-attentive level. Um, so just a summary, again, individuals are capable of processing trust on a pre-attentive level approximately a half in, in experiment one, two-thirds in experiment two were very consistent um, <clears throat> and very significant correlation between trust in the first and the second trials when we even average across all the participants in the study. And this leads us to conclude that the pre-conscious mind probably plays a larger role in how sites are judged than previously believed. All the things that you'd look at trust are always on the conscious level around just how much time, um, you know, about interacting with a site for a minute or five minutes or several visits, right? No one had looked at it before on a pre-attentive level. Um, so this is really just the, the first phase in our research uh, because there's some really interesting follow-up work that we want to do with this. Um, specifically, what's the relationship between trust on a pre-attentive and a conscious level. So as the next stage we'd like to do is replicate this and see, all right, if somebody has 20 seconds or a minute to look at something, how strongly does that correlate or is that predictive of the, um, uh, on a pre-attentive? In other words, can what you get after 50 milliseconds predict what you're gonna get after a minute? Um, and then what are the specific design attributes that impact pre-attentive trust. What are those design primitives that seem to make a site le more or less trustworthy on, on a pre-attentive level? And that's really the crux of it, right? You want to be able to uh, avoid having somebody form an opinion about trust within you know, the first tenth of a second. Um, what is it that's driving that? And what are the effects of trust, distrust, primes on subsequent cognitive acts. So how does it affect your, um, um, how you think about it later on and how you behave? Um, and, and lastly, what, what are the other aspects of UX that could be developed pre-attentively? We just chose trust and Lingard looked at visual appeal. But what are the other attributes or aspects of user experience that also might be um, uh, develop pre-attentively? It's a really interesting question. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of talk about how this fits into kind of a larger model about trust and web design. Um, so I, I was just putting this together yesterday actually thinking about this and especially how it relates to the work of BJ Fogg. Um, and there's some, definitely some, some overlap here. 
and the way I, I see about stages of, of trust in web design, there's something that happens at exposure, let's say less than 200 milliseconds, right? So this is based on certain design primitives. So if, if I show you something in a, a 20th of a second, you can't tell what their affiliations are or see their contact information, but there's something about whether it's the color, the density, the layout that you are getting, okay? Um, and I think that there's something that happens with exposure leading up to an inspection. So this might happen in the first few seconds. So this is based on a brief inspection of specific elements, right? Just looking at whether it's the presence or absence of something or making a very quick judgment about it. Um, there's leading that into the interaction. So actually using something, right? This is probably more than three seconds. Um, so you're using specific elements and deciding or forming like, hey, no, I don't get it. I don't, there's something about it. This site I trust or I don't trust, um, leading to opinion, right? This is what um, Fogg called earned credibility, but it's really based kind of a long-term opinion based on multiple interactions that takes really into account the entire design. But you can think of it kind of in this life cycle of how trust is formed as part of um, a web design. Um, so what, is this, what does this mean for you, okay? Um, first off, this is, I was debating whether to put this slide in there because it seems so obvious to me, but why, why does trust matter? Um, it's really the key element in design that impacts both short-term and long-term behaviors and perceptions of your, your site, your company, etc. It directly ties to your sales, your loyalty, support costs, uh, session duration, SAT, ease of use, efficiency, all the metrics that I I love dearly, trust is absolutely a huge contributor to it. Um, so if, if you're not worrying about trust, uh, perhaps you should because it really matters. Um, what you should do, um, so it, I think it really depends on the stages that you're in. So um, reviewing designs prior to launch and on a periodic basis. So uh, there's something that we'd call blink tests basically seeing what type of information people are getting uh, after very brief exposures. Um, and you could do some type of blink test to look at um, perhaps on a pre-attentive level or even uh, on an attentive level um, what people are getting and what the trustworthiness is like. So show your, flash your site for one second and have, have or different sites and just see is there anything that is um, majorly wrong with that initial exposure, okay? Um, and then suggest so doing some kind of deep dive usability evaluations to see are there specific elements that um, are driving trustworthiness up or down, right? Um, and then doing something that's quant-based to be able to validate the design against specific aspects of trust. So this is where the, both the qualitative and quantitative come together in a really nice way. And then um, try to, as, as, whether you're, you're a researcher or a designer or, or what have you, is try to look at the design as a dialogue with the user. So, you know, the way I, I see it is, you know, when I go to a website I've never been to, it's like meeting a stranger. And if the very first thing they do is they ask me, um, hi, can I have your money? or you know, I'm going to be put off, but it's 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 a dialogue, it's a relationship that you're building, and and try to think of it in, in social terms. I think will will really um, uh, help give you really important insight into um, what it, um, what the right design should be. Um, so just to wrap up, um, you know, in this case, you need to sweat the little things. Um, the devil is in the details. And whether it's a single typo, or uh, it's the color palette, or the how difficult it is to find the contact information, all these little things do make a big difference. I see it time and time again. That's why we have A-B testing. That's why we do user research. It's the little things that can really tip the balance. And for any 
large organization too, it gets a lot of traffic to your website. Um, even the little differences can make big differences in terms of your bottom line. So um, oftentimes it's very easy to miss those little things. Um, and I think, you know, trust and, and how we approach trust and design is, is certainly one of those things. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, we're ready for our second speaker uh, this morning, uh, Mark Resnick. Uh, Mark has his uh, PhD uh, attained at from the University of Michigan, uh, Industrial Engineering. Uh, he's a professor at uh, Bentley, uh, teaches along with Bill. Uh, and he teaches uh, human factors engineering and information design. Uh, he's actually uh, widely experienced as a consultant uh, as well and uh, has worked uh, for a number of leading entities, including NASA. Um, he's published a ton of papers over the years. And, if you're interested, uh, many of them are available on the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society uh, site. Uh, we, uh, Mark is going to talk to us today about uh, how motivated reasoning uh, impacts user experience. And um, Mark is probably one of the most experienced uh, UX professionals uh, to look at this whole area. And he's going to bring forth some of the latest research in uh, reasoning. Uh, some of that uh, you've already heard this morning from Bill. So um, without Further ado, here we go. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, you know, Bill, Bill's talk uh, realizes that I had a lot of pressure on me because 50 milliseconds have already gone by. You've already decided if you're going to like my talk or not. I'm done. Let's all go have another cup of coffee. Um, you'll, you'll notice a, a little bit of a shift. Um, Bill and I work together, we work on projects together, and we actually are a very good fit because as, as he put in his introduction, um, he's a data-driven guy um, who likes to match research and practice. And I'm an idea-driven guy who likes to match research and practice. So between the two of us, we have the, the, uh, the project put together pretty well. Um, and just as he started his talk by finding his deck. Let me see if I can do the same. And you'll notice that I actually titled my slide oops, um, Brain Science, because that is what I'm going to focus a little bit on today, is um, a lot of recent findings that have looked at how does the brain actually work. And I won't talk about a whole lot of data in that sense, because the data for that is fMRI slides and yellow lights on this part of the brain and red lights on this one, um, which don't really help you design the UX very much. But I'm going to tease you with the ideas that have come out of this research to think about how can we apply it to UX design, um, understanding that there's a lot we thought we knew. And it turns out we might have been wrong. So keep that in mind as I go through my talk. I will be challenging perhaps some of the ideas that you've been practicing with for the last however long you've been in, in UX. And part of this is that um, what we've noticed as, as the thing that kind of led into applying this to UX is that as designers, we always, or we started out giving our customers, giving our users exactly what they ask for. They say, what do you need in order for this to be a useful interface for you? What kinds of functionality should it have? What kinds of layout should it have? What does it need to have in order to support the needs that, um, that are important for you to do your job or do your shopping or do your social networking or whatever it is that you're using the system for? What do you want? And they are very vocal, as I'm sure any of you who have done field testing know, at telling us exactly what it is that they want. And so then we give it to them, and then they don't like it, or it's not good enough, or why? Why don't they just, and they're told, they told us what they wanted, right? So why don't, why isn't that good enough? And it turns out that they don't have access inside their own heads to what they want. I mean, we know that's true of four-year-olds. How many of you have kids? Yeah, I don't even need to ask you. You know that they are not very good at, OK, you want a cookie? Here's a cookie. No, that you don't want a cookie anymore. What do you want? <laughs> it's kind of a shame that users who are 
50 years of experience and they've been working in this company for, and they don't know what they want either. Um, and unfortunately, we have finally realized that maybe asking them what they want is maybe not the best way to go, to design a good user experience. And I'm not sure if we've, kind of, we've uh, developed the fMRI slides, we'll put them in, a, in an MRI, I don't know if any of you have an MRI? I'm getting you back, uh, giving you a little arm work out here, but uh, getting your blood flowing. Um, if you've ever been in one, you know that's probably not the best way to do our UX research either. You know, we could put Bill's slides in the MRI and then we could actually measure what their brain is doing as they're going through it. Um, maybe we'll get there at some point. Even more than eye tracking, right? Wouldn't that, that'll get people into the Kravitz Center, more than 35 people. So, um, what I'm going to do is talk about some of the, you know, the computer models that we used to use to model human thinking. And even more so, talk about now maybe what we've learned and how we've maybe gone beyond that. Um, talking about cognitive neuroscience and behavioral neuroscience and thinking about the way people really think. And the real fundamental difference that I think we finally sunk into our heads is that we didn't develop in modern society. Where did we develop? We developed running around for 10,000, 100,000 years on the African savanna. And if you thought like a computer here, you would have gotten eaten by the lion way before you had a chance to come up with your answer. So what we really did was we looked at whatever was in our field of view in 50 milliseconds and figured out what we had to do. We looked at the food and then we got a feeling, we got a pit in our stomach, just how hungry we were. And we looked at the hyena and we thought that hyena is going to go get the food if we don't. And so we felt loss aversion. We felt this fear of losing the one asset that we had, that food that was over there, because he didn't have bank accounts then. <laughs> and we didn't look at the lion, or we, then we looked at the lion and we got another pit in our stomach that said, don't want to go there. And we looked at the tree and said, maybe that's a place we can go to get away from the lion, but then we're going to lose our food to the hyena. And in that 50 milliseconds, or maybe the 200 milliseconds, I don't know which window it falls into, we had to decide, what do we do? Do we run up the tree? Do we grab the food and run up the tree? Do we just hightail it out of here and get away from everybody? And maybe the lion will eat the hyena, or maybe the lion will eat the food and chase away the hyena? And all of that is just going around, and we didn't say, okay, what's the probability? And what's the cost-benefit analysis of the food? How many calories do you think is in there? A little too much saturated fat? Maybe we want to stay away from that. We've been on this diet for a while. No, we didn't do that. And maybe 100,000 years ago, there were people who did think that way. They did not live long enough to reproduce. <laughs> and we did not descend from those ancestors. We descended from the ones that said, I'm out of here in 50 milliseconds or less. And so our brains developed to think that way for a good reason. Now, maybe modern society is throwing us for a loop. Now we have to figure out what do we invest our mutual fund for in our 401k? Do we want to put it in balanced income or do we want to go a little bit more aggressive? What is the stuff? And so now we kind of need to do a little bit more thinking. We need to sit down now, how many of you do pros and cons lists or uh, other things where we're actually trying to use quantitative maximum utility analysis, either in our jobs, in our, in our personal lives, and our brain is just not wired to do that. So we can either do two things. We can either try to force our users to think this way, which is what we've been trying to do for 30 years, or we can just accept the fact that it's not going to happen and start designing for the way people really think, to try to take advantage of the pre-attentive processes, to try to get people to like our website because of the visual appeal and, and try to create some initial trust and then figure the rest will take care of itself because they're going to like us and then they're going to have all these other things we know about like anchoring biases and confirmation biases and the things we have known for, for a little bit of time in, um, in psychology. So um, my personal expertise is in applying this to things like enterprise systems where 
people are using uh, a computer 24 hours a day, unfortunately, and um, using it for a lot of different things where we really want their performance to be 100%. It's not about preference. If you have a captive audience where they have to use your computer because that's what they use at work, you have to use, they have to use your system, it should be all about efficiency and productivity, but it's not. Um, and then also social networking, which is completely the opposite side, but also what people seem to be doing 24 hours a day now, which is how do we get people to trust someone on a social network that they've never met because they're a friend of a friend? Hmm. I don't trust my friend. Why would I trust the friend of a friend? <laughs> Someone just asked, invited me to connect to them on LinkedIn. I don't even know that person. Do they have an agenda? Why do they want to link to me? Are they, they know I know Joe, and they want to meet Joe, so they don't really care about me. They're just trying to meet. Or maybe they figure they're going to be on the job market someday. I've got a lot of connections, and they're using me that way. Or maybe they thought, oh, you guys, look at that picture. I'm going to go link up with I don't know. So what's my initial thought of trust? And it turns out that that might have a fundamental impact ongoing for the rest of my life on how I relate to that individual based on my first initial impression. That puts a lot of pressure on us to develop good first initial impressions, not just as a LinkedIn profile, but when we're designing our UX. Because it's, uh, what, uh, I, I forget which uh, product has this as part of their TV commercials, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. I think it's a shampoo. But the, it's true of UX uh, also. So where do we get that, that pit in our stomach? And there's different parts of the brain. And I'll, I'll be throwing out some, some neuroanatomy on you. Don't worry, there won't be a test later. Um, but that pit in your stomach that I've been um, referring to, that's in the basal ganglia, which is over here, that reptilian brain that some people talk about, even though that's kind of a misnomer. We have this also this great area called the prefrontal cortex, which is good at figuring out what mutual fund to invest in. It actually does the quantitative mathematical cost-benefit analysis kind of stuff. The problem is it usually loses when there's a fight between the basal ganglia and the prefrontal cortex. I'll mention that a little bit. But what really happens is we kind of separate this into different categories. And the hyena is in competition with us for the food. The food is what we would really like to have. That's the, the asset that we want, especially if we're hungry. The tree rep is safety and the, the lion is, is danger, which one of those gives us the biggest pit in our stomach? And that's the way we decide. So we call that a somatic marker. And somatic it just means what, what emotion is it representing? Is it trust? Is it visual appeal? Is it something else? Is it money? Why do casinos get you to drop so much money there? You're sitting at a slot machine, and you know the casino's got the odds, right? I mean, how many of you really think you can win on a slot machine over time? Good luck. But they have certain tricks that give us that feeling, that somatic marker, that visceral pit in our stomach that makes us think we're going to win. What do casinos do? Bright lights. Ching, 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 ching. Somebody's winning, right? If that person's winning, I must be able to win. Let me keep putting in the money. So of course, casinos probably are better UX designers than we'll ever be. They've been doing it for 50 years without even knowing um, the, the neuroscience research that I'm going to be talking about. They figured it out on their own. So did Bill's used car salesman. Right? They've been selling. Somehow they get it to work. Infomercials. By now, only three left. They have no idea that there's only three left because they made the commercial three weeks ago. And they put that there's only three left in the commercial then. They don't know there's only three left, but they know that's going to get you to buy. Limited supply available. Only two more weeks. And some of them now, they have those countdown clocks. You have to buy in the next 90 seconds to get this deal. Oh my god, only 90 seconds left. I better buy it now. And that stuff all works. So why does that matter for UX designers? Well, people are starting to move to digital cash. Now, if there's digital cash, where'd the ching-ching go on my slot machine? 
right? What happens if that ching ching goes away? Then the casinos don't make as much money because people stop putting the money in. So as casinos are moving slot machines to, you put in your credit card and you never have to see another dollar until your flight leaves two weeks later. <laughs> and meanwhile, you're now thousands of dollars in the hole. But if you don't actually see the money going in, you're not looking at the lion. And if you don't see the lion, even though one part of your brain knows that there's money being subtracted from your account, unless you see that lion, there's no pit in your stomach. And if you don't feel the pit in your stomach, your basal ganglia tells you that this is fun, keep going. Because you have that, that, the fun pit, the good pit, the happy pit. Your basal ganglia is telling you, no, this is great. Let's listen to the ching ching. You're only five minutes away from winning the jackpot. Look at the jackpot. It's in these big letters on the side, $50,000. And you're going to make, you're going to win it. You know you are. So what they're doing is they've got the food image all over the casino. And they've hidden the lion. And they've hidden the hyena. And... I'm not sure exactly what they do with the tree. Maybe the analogy doesn't work perfectly. But because they're designing the interface, they can manipulate the heck out of it. So they can, take, they can put in the digital uh, credit card reader on the slot machine to get rid of the lion. But they don't want to get rid of the food. So what they do is they just make it go ching, ching, ching for no good reason. The speaker's on the ceiling going ching, 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 making you think that people are, are um, winning. And your own slot machine, if you lose money, it doesn't say, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't have the sound of the money going in. <laughs> but it'll fake the ching, 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 ching uh, when you do win. And they're not doing that because they're dumb, right? They're not, uh, it really works. So can we use those same kind of techniques in designing UX to create visceral 50 millisecond appeal as, as one of the first things that we want to do? Um, so that's, that's actually something that, uh, that we can apply to our UX. How do we get the food to appear? How do we get their, the pit to be the good pit rather than the bad pit? Or can we get the bad pit to make them want to do more by making them fear losing? Loss aversion is actually one of the most powerful things that could hit your brain. I'll talk about that in a little bit. We hate to lose. How many of you hate to lose? Right? We, we take a little bit of extra risk if we feel like we're about to lose. We hate losing. Now, unfortunately, this was a really real, well, on the fortunate side, this was a great way to evolve over 100,000 years of running around the savanna. Because it was kind of important to grab the food when it was there. Because you didn't know when you were going to get another one. It might be worth fighting off the hyena once or twice to get the food. Um, it was important to run away from the lion and climb up the tree. Every time there was a lion, it was a good idea to run away. Just, I mean, it just was. But now modern society has really screwed us up because reality is not always reality. Sometimes you get engrossed in a movie and you have an experience in that movie, a user experience, a customer experience, just like when people are doing real life things. And the problem is, six months later, we forget, wait, did I learn, how many have ever actually had this thought? Because I do all the time. Wait, is that, did that really happen to me or did I see that on TV? We don't remember. Because the way that our memory is actually constructed, now we're talking about the hippocampus, is we remember the fact, the event, we remember the association, but we don't remember where we learned it. Because here, it didn't matter where we learned that lions have sharp teeth. All that matters is that we know that lions have sharp teeth. But if it was in a movie, maybe lions don't really have sharp teeth. Maybe it was just a good costume designer. The problem is our brains didn't evolve to watch movies. Our brains evolved for real tigers. And so we can create fake visceral experiences. Another problem is that sometimes people experience outliers. What happens when something has a one in a million chance, but the first time you pull the slot machine, you win? Do you happen to get the one in a million chance? That happens one in a million times. You're messed up forever in terms of your probability judgments. 
because you always are going to be optimistic about slot machines. And eventually, you're going to lose all that money because you're going to keep putting it back wanting to win again. You want that adrenaline push. Uh, it's actually dopamine. I'll talk about that in a minute, too, because that actually does matter. Um, so one of the things that we want to do in our UX design is make sure that the, the, the visceral, pre-attentive, 50 millisecond experience is pleasure, is food, and not, um, and not the lion. And it turns out that it's even worse than that. Because they've done studies where they took identical user experiences, identical website designs, same navigation label, same number of steps to get from the beginning to the end, exactly the same design, except one had a better color palette than the other, so that visceral 50 millisecond experience was positive for one and not as positive for the other. And then they had people buy a sweater and contact customer service, do all these things, and then they had them rate not the aesthetics, not the trust, not the visual appeal, but the usability. And guess what happened? They rated the usability higher for the one where it had the good 50 millisecond um, visceral experience, even though the usability was actually the same. Even if the usability was actually worse, they didn't realize that what they were rating was the visual appeal. What they thought was that they were rating the usability because their brain was happy. Their brain had the food. Their basal ganglia was going ding, 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 and their amygdala, which is where the memory is stored for emotions. And as long as their amygdala was happy, they thought it was a good usability. Oh yeah, that was very easy to use. And in fact, they used really, really detailed scales to try to figure out if this was a real effect or not. Was this usable? How was the navigation, rate the navigation of this website? And if it had a good visceral initial experience, they would rate the usability higher, even if it was worse, and vice versa. If that initial experience was bad, then they would rate the usability worse, even if the usability was actually better. That puts a lot of pressure on us to have good initial experience design. And it's because it's not the prefrontal cortex that's making this decision. The prefrontal cortex seems to lose, which is uh, a kind of a shame. Um, there's actually been uh, some recent, recent work which has looked at um, things like testosterone. I, everyone probably already knows what I'm going to, or at least has a clue of what I'm going to say, because we have this visceral 50 millisecond impression of what testosterone implies. And all of you probably have a different imagination of that. And now whatever I say about it isn't going to matter. You've already figured out what I'm going to say. So now you can start daydreaming about something else while I'm giving the details. <laughs> it happens. But it turns out this is what the actual research shows. So if you do want to learn about it, you can pay attention. <laughs> Testosterone increases the value of the high-risk, high-reward option at the expense of the low-risk, low-reward option. What does that mean? In theory, high-risk, high-reward, and low-risk, low-reward kind of balance itself out. Right? You, could, you could design the exact risk and the exact reward so that they're perfectly equal. Put some testosterone into the person, male or female. The male worse, though. And they're more likely to pick the high risk, high reward, even if the options are objectively equal. In evolutionary times, that was a good thing, because when were you experiencing high testosterone? When you were actually physically stronger. You were better able to fight off the hyena for the food. Better able to run away from the lion. So it was possible to take the high risk, high reward option, and you're more likely to survive it. So in, uh, in evolution, it was actually a better thing for testosterone to make us take the high risk, high reward, because we were more likely to get the high reward. It was a good thing. But now it doesn't work so much. If we look at stock traders, this is where they did the testosterone research, go figure. <laughs> it turns out that on sunny days, stockbrokers make more risky trades. Now, sunny days down the street, at the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, that, they could be buying Chinese stocks. We don't know what the weather is there. And yet, they take more risky trades on sunny days when there was less traffic on their way to work. That's not good. 
<laughs> and in fact, the same thing happens on the opposite. When we have more cortisol, which is what we have when we're under stress, people don't take risky trades. But if there was traffic, or if you're having a fight with your kid before, you know, you can't wear that to school, they don't take as, uh, they take less risky trades. My 401k is on the line and they're taking less risky trades because they didn't want their kid to wear that uh, high cut shirt to, to school. I don't want that to affect my ability to retire someday, uh, but it does. So can we design the user experience of a stock trading interface where Bill has a lot of experience? Can we actually put in neutral images on the screen to try to get rid of the testosterone and get rid of the cortisol? Will that work? Or maybe we can have it attached to the weather channel so that on really sunny days it shows more depressing pictures and on cloudy days it shows more happy pictures? I don't know if one's tried that yet, but it could work. Could we maybe present data to people in a way that gets rid of some of those gut reactions and in increases, it, it basically what, it, what we could do is we could give the basal ganglion nothing to look at. So then maybe the prefrontal cortex will have a chance in this fight. Or we can create performance management systems. One of the things that the recent JP Morgan um, investigation found, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, they just lost. Well, it, when they first announced it, it was $2 billion, then it went up to $3 billion because of a rogue trader in London. And oh, it seems like that's happening every week now. <laughs> um, but what they found is that during bull markets, there were more incentives to trade more risky. And during bear markets, there were less incentives to trade more risky. Exactly the opposite of what we want. The regular person can be stupid, and we could follow the market and buy high and sell low and because I mean, we're individuals but these people are institutional investors they have my pension on their shoulders i i want them to be doing the opposite i want them to be doing counter cyclical trading which actually has a better chance of being right but their performance management systems are backwards they're get they're actually encouraging them to get caught up in bull markets and to run like hell during bear markets. We want to be doing actually the opposite. So can we actually design the performance management systems underlying the, the use their their investor experience, the broker experience, to try to be counter cyclical instead? Maybe we can do that. So um, what I'm going to be doing is talking about a couple of different things. I'll try to go through each one a little bit, and then maybe if we have time, go through um, some of them in a little more detail, or I'll be around uh, after the session or by email afterwards, or, or however you like, um, if any of these in particular uh, pique your interest. Because all of them have really come out as things that are, um, well, really important, and not something that our old computer model of information processing would have predicted. And so that's what we need to, to think about a little bit more. So I'll, I'll talk about these um, as we go. Um, don't worry, there's, again, there's not going to be a test on this later. But this is what we started doing. We started looking at just what are the different parts of the brain. And it turns out that the model that works best is, uh, I don't know if any of you have read uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin book about Abraham Lincoln, The Team of Rivals, where the best thing to do is you don't, and if you're a recently elected head of state, to take uh, a cabinet and find people who all agree with you. The best thing to do is find a bunch of people who hate your guts so that they're going to argue every decision you make because that's the way to come out with the right answer at the end. Turns out that's actually the way the brain is wired. Your basal ganglia wants instant gratification. Your prefrontal cortex wants long-term gains. You're, and so if they're really fighting it out, if we can put them all in neutral ground, then we're more likely to come up with the best answer. The get it, putting them in equal footing is, is the, the problem that we have. So that's kind of the first thing um, that we did. And then the next thing that we did was try to figure out how it actually works. What's getting active in different situations? There might be some decisions that we make where one part of the brain is more active than others. Well, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? We want to maybe try to think about that. Um, what's turning on and what's turning off um, in different situations. So for example, there's a phenomenon called hypercorrection. Have you ever been in a situation you, where you realize that 
Something you've been either pronouncing or spelling one way your whole life turns out to be wrong. That's a good way of remembering the pit in your stomach experience. Because the first thought that most people have there is not, OK, I need to learn the correct spelling so I can do well on my spelling test in third grade English. No, it's, oh my god, who knows? <laughs> How many of my friends have been letting me spell that wrong my whole life or saying that wrong my whole life? They never told me. What did they think about me that I've been spelling potatoes with, uh, wasn't that the, the Dan Quayle uh, thing from a long time ago? Um, that embarrassment and that surprise is actually a really powerful influence on our cognition. That's not what a computer would do. I've never seen my computer blush. <laughs> but it turns out that there's a whole big chunk in our brain um, that specifically gets activated because of that embarrassment. It's called the medial frontal gyrus, but you don't have to worry about that. But that actually winds up taking control of our, th it's almost like if you have obsessive compulsive disorder for 10 minutes. Oh my god, I can't, I, you can't think of anything else. You're just worried about who knows that you've been pronouncing this wrong and how come they didn't tell you? And then, because that was so salient to you and it sucked up all the neurotransmitters into that part of your brain, you'll never forget that word ever again. And that's a great way to learn, really, because you will pronounce that word correctly or spell that word correctly for the rest of your life. Um, so that's why it's called hypercorrection. <laughs> And one of the ways that we know how that works is uh, through functional imaging. We've also started thinking a little bit more about the impact of emotion on thinking. The way that we used to do cognitive and behavioral research was, all right, emotion is just going to mess up our research. So the only way that we can do this correctly is if we put people in a basement, put blinders on, pick something that has no emotion in it whatsoever, like memorizing random four-letter combinations that aren't actually the word. Memorize X, V, F, Z. And by taking all the emotion out of this process, we can figure out how cognition really works. Yeah, but how many of you ever have to memorize random sets of four letters that don't make up a word? Not modern society, maybe we have to do that a little more than we used to. That's what passwords are supposed to be, right? That's what they tell us. Even though, what are our passwords really? Your dog's name. <laughs> Why do we do that? Because we're not good at remembering random sets of four letters. So we use our dog's name because security or ease of use to remember our password, which one is more important? Well, it turns out security is actually more important, <laughs> according to our prefrontal cortex. But they don't win the fight. Who wins the fight? It's our amygdala which tells us that our dog's name is going to make our lives so much better until identity theft rolls around. <laughs> OK, so let's just pretend that's never going to happen. And then we can just use our dog's name for the rest of our life and have a nice, happy, healthy life. And it's easy to do that. We'll, we'll talk about that, that later. That's what I called motivated reasoning. Just the name should tell you exactly what that means, right? Motivated reasoning. We don't decide what does the data say, and then what can we learn from that? What we say is, what do we want the answer to be? And then how do we manipulate the data so that we proved it? And I we'll, uh, probably won't have time to talk about that in a whole lot of detail. But if you want to know some of the really, really fascinating results behind that, we do that in a remarkable number of situations. Voting for president, picking a spouse. I mean, the most important decisions you can make in the world, we don't do it based on the data. First, we decide what we want the answer to be. And then we figure out what data to look at in order to be confident that we're right and to feel good about our answer. It's backwards. And you might say, well, we don't want people to think that way. Stop it. <laughs> but we have a choice, as I said at the beginning. We can e either design our UXs to force people to think more logically, in which case we will lose. Or we can try to at least mitigate the damage as much as possible. In which case, at least we'll maybe have a little bit less damage. Um, the personal example for me was skiing in bad weather. OK, I could get into an accident. I could get lost. You see on the news you know, people who get into avalanches and all that kind of thing. But it's going to be fun. And loss aversion. I've already slept up to the ski lift. I've already spent all this money on my lift ticket and on my hotel and on the, the train or the plane or however I got there. 
So I don't want to waste all that money. I want to go skiing. I haven't been skiing in six months. I really want to go. So what are the chances that I'm actually going to get injured in the bad weather? <laughs> Not going to happen to me. And it's amazing how we can, how we can do that. So, but one of, the, one of the more fascinating studies, this was actually a long time ago, there was a, a patient who actually had a, a cognitive damage. He had a, I think it was a rod in his head or a motorcycle accident where his emotional center of his brain was damaged, didn't work anymore. So they said, wow, this guy can be the most rational, best decision maker in the world. He should be able to do cost benefit analyses every time and figure out exactly what the expected return of this option is and the expected return of that option and make the best decision. I want this person running my pension fund. And so then they actually tested him to see how did this person make decisions and was he really better? And this is what happened. He was able to say, okay, um, if I make this choice, this could happen and this could happen. In my skiing example, I could hit a tree, probability of 0.4. I could get lost, probability of 0.1, or I could not go skiing, in which case I lost this amount of money on my plane ticket and, uh, and I could get, go through the hassle of trying to get a refund from the airline or whatever. So I have all my choices well mapped out. I have my, pro, my pros and cons list perfectly designed. Okay, so which one do you do? I don't know. He was paralyzed by indecision. Paralyzed, could not decide. Why? Because that's a value judgment. Where do we make value judgments? The emotional segment, which for him was broken. So he was really, really good at laying out the problem, but could not decide. So we need both. Emotion isn't a different kind of decision making. It's part of decision making. It's part of rational decision making. Rational decision making requires emotion as part of the process. And that's something that we used to try to separate and now we're trying to integrate because in the real world, emotion is always there. The stockbroker, we don't want them to be using their emotion when deciding where to put my pension fund, but they do. And the person on Facebook, half the room, um, they're doing that too, probably even more, and, and, uh, and everything else. So these are really things that we need to start thinking about. And now we're really starting to get cool because now we've got these brain machine interfaces where we can actually have it go in both directions, where we can have different things happen in a simulator and we can map out exactly what's going on in the person's brain. And now, and this is really recent, we can actually start taking what's going on in the brain, attaching that to the controls and have people be able to manipulate the computer just by thinking. That's cool. I can't wait till they develop those interfaces. I'm not a hardware guy, but that's, that's some cool stuff. But at least on the inside, what we can do is we can say, OK, let's say you're driving down the highway 60 miles an hour because there's a lot of traffic. But it's really close. You don't have a whole lot of leeway between you and the person ahead of you, you and the person behind you, you and the person to the right, you and the person to the left. And the car over here swerves in and cuts you off. You got a couple of different choices, right? You can slam on the brakes to try to get behind them. You can veer to the left to try to go around them. You can speed up to try to go ahead of them. There's all these different things you could do, but you can't do all of them at once. You can't hit the gas, the brake, and the steering wheel. That would probably just make you spin out and that would be worse. But you also don't have time to decide which is the best way to go. So if we actually let our prefrontal cortex make the most accurate probabilistic expected return decision, we've crashed before it's done. The cycle time is just too, if we want to use our computer analogy, the prefrontal cortex has a slower cycle time. The page takes a long time to load. So we can't rely on that. So our emotional decision making actually saves our life when someone cuts us off on the highway. What gives us the best pit in the stomach reaction? Is it swerving? Is it hitting the brakes? Is it hitting the gas? And that's how we decide in that kind of situation. So making the optimal rational decision is being as emotional as possible. As contradictory as that sounds to us on the surface, turns out that's actually the truth. 
So we're really relying on those somatic markers that I mentioned earlier. What, what kind of pit in the stomach do we feel for each of the options? And we don't actually do a cost-benefit analysis. We satisfy. Uh, I know Bill mentioned satisficing once too. Does everyone know what, what that is? That's basically taking the first decision, the first option that we think of that seems like it's going to have a reasonable result. So we don't try to take the best option. Once we find one that's going to save our lives in the, on the highway, uh, who cares if there's a better one? If this one's going to get me out of this jam, I'll take it. It's not worth wasting the time to think of a better one. And we do that when we don't have a whole lot of time. And we also do that when we don't really care about the result very much. And I'll have a few examples of that as we go through this too. Um, so there's a lot of science behind brain science. Um, how much time do I have left? Keep going? Oh, good, good. Um, but companies don't really have the time to be brain science researchers, obviously. Um, but many of these things can be really, really powerful tools. There's, there's too much for me to present to you in 20 minutes. Um, so what I'm going to do is try to um, show you a couple of the findings, maybe tease you a little bit with some of these concepts, and, and, and get you thinking. And maybe you can pick the ones that you do have time to go into in, uh, in a little bit more uh, detail. So one of the, one of the uh, aspects of decision making that, uh, that comes into play probably more often than we would like is instant gratification. We all hear about instant gratification. There have been a lot of studies, and this is probably familiar to you all on a, on a visceral level, because you've all probably succumbed to the desire for instant gratification, where you did the stupid thing, and you knew it was the stupid thing at the time, but you just wanted it anyway for some reason. Right, lots of examples of these in our lives. And um, this is actually uh, probably one of the more common examples. And they've actually done research in this. this is, I'm in the wrong field. I shouldn't be doing UX. I should be doing chocolate cake research. <laughs> but what they did was they actually gave people the choice between fruit or chocolate cake. Chocolate cake, fruit. Chocolate cake, fruit. Guess what people picked? Chocolate cake. They said, OK, forget that. We're going to give you the same option tomorrow. What do you want to have tomorrow? Oh, tom well, you know, I'm, I am on this diet. I should be good. I'm going to have the chocolate cake today. So I'll have the fruit tomorrow. And then the next day, they came in. They had the chocolate cake and the fruit. They said, OK, yesterday you said you're going to have the fruit today. But we'll give the option. Which one do you want? All right, I'll have the chocolate cake. Tomorrow, I'll have the fruit. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? They actually did this research on thousands of people, and it happened more often than probability would suggest if we were really rational decision makers. And one of those reasons is that it's two different parts of the brain that are assigned to make decisions for right now and that are designed to make decisions for later. And I've mentioned them already. Our amygdala and our basal ganglia wants the chocolate cake. And our prefrontal cortex says, you know, our cholesterol is really high. We're going to be dead. How many chocolate cakes can we have if we're... <laughs> so I should have the fruit, and then I can have the chocolate cake later. But right now, it's easy to let our basal ganglia, our amygdala, take over. And our prefrontal cortex is really good at deciding what we're going to do tomorrow. And so what happens is that we have to set up our user experience so that people are not making decisions for what to do right now. They're making decisions for what to do tomorrow. And then we can, if we want them to be using cost-benefit analysis and rational numbers and that sort of thing, if we want them to be making visceral decisions because we're selling used cars, then we want them to use their amygdala, and we want them to make their decision now. That's how those infomercials do it, right? By now, only 30 seconds left. Because what they want to do, if, if they don't have that countdown clock, 30 seconds, 29, 28, 27, you can say, well, you know what? This is a $50, uh, they have all these crazy things on sale on TV now, the uh, American Gold Eagle coin, only 30 left. That's a, that's, you know, that's 30 bucks, so that's 100 bucks, so that's 150 bucks. I'll think about it, I'll write down the 1-800 number, and I'll decide later. And then later, you're just not going to buy it, because that's a stupid thing to buy. <laughs> but
But if they can get you to make the decision right now, they can get your basal ganglia or your amygdala to make the decision. And then if it seems cool, or if your loss aversion kicks in and you're afraid to lose out on what could be a great opportunity, then that's how they win. Um, and and it, it's amazing just how strong uh, an impact that has. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, it's now sort of becoming a, a meme, the marshmallow study. And you, I see a few, a few heads nodding. But for those of you who don't know about it, they took these fourth graders and they put them in a room and they put some marshmallows on a, a plate in the table, on, on the table. Oh, I'm sorry, one marshmallow. And they said, you can eat that marshmallow if you'd like, but if you wait 15 minutes, you can have two marshmallows. And then the experimenter left the room. And of course, there was a two-way mirror. And they watched the kid. The kid's like. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the kids ate the marshmallow. And some of the kids waited and got two in 15 minutes. And they looked at what was the difference in behavior between the kids that ate the marshmallow and the ones that didn't. And the ones that didn't had to distract themselves. They couldn't even look at the marshmallow. <laughs> they had to forget it was there. Because if you don't even know it's there, the basal ganglia loses a little bit of its influence. But then a remarkable thing happened just by chance. 20, 15, 20 years later, the person who was doing that research, his, his daughter, who was one of those fourth graders, I don't know if that's a little bit of a conflict of interest, but anyway, um, was having her, I don't know if it was high school reunion or something that happened 15 years later. And so he said, wow, we can actually go find out what happened to all these kids. And what they did was they actually looked at what happened to all of those kids. And it turned out the ones that were able to resist temptation for a marshmallow for 15 minutes had higher incomes, were more likely to have graduated from college, were less likely to have gone to prison, had lower divorce rates. I mean, it's amazing what a little bit of self-control can do. But it really does matter, because instant gratification is done by the part of your brain that isn't making rational decisions. It's the part of your brain that gets slapped in the bar because you said the wrong thing. It's the part of your brain that's always eating the chocolate cake. It's the part of your brain that's not studying for the exam because there's a party going on. Or because there's a, a rerun of Hogan's Heroes? <laughs> One more song, and then I'll study. And it turns out that that has such an insidious impact on every decision that we make, minute by minute, day by day, that if you can with, withstand that instant gratification, I mean, it, it really does. It totally changes your life. Now, of course, we're not pop psychologists here. Um, this is about UX design. How do we leverage that in UX design? How do we change someone's decision making from instant to later? Well, um, are any of you familiar with the book Nudge? Or Cass Sunstein and Robert Thaler, they're um, actually in, in economics, but it has very similar kinds of uh, impacts as, as user experience does. They have an incredible study on 401k investments. Now let's say you're sitting down, you just got a new job, you got the salary, you're all excited, and says, okay, how much do you want to put into your 401k every month? Uh, especially, let's say you just graduated from college, it's the first time you're ever making money, no way. Next year, I'm gonna start putting a lot of money into my 401k. But right now, I'm blowing it. I'm buying a new car, and I'm getting a better house, and I'm getting better clothes, and I'm doing this, and that's what really happens. That's not just in the research lab. So, but the people were, they were sure, next year, I'm gonna put, start putting money in my 401k. But then the next year, they came back and said, okay, it's open enrollment period. What do you wanna do with your 401k? I still got more things I wanna buy and more life I wanna enjoy, but next year, I'm gonna uh, start investing in my 401k. But this year, I still have things I need to do. I just, I'm getting married, I wanna save up for a nice ring, and. All these things. So what they did was they said, well, what if we do this? Let's actually take them right from that first day and say, okay, sign the contract now to start investing next year. We're not going to take any money out of your paycheck now. 
We're going to take you, whatever raise you get next year. Let's say you get a two percent raise. That two percent is what you're going to is what is going to be invested in your 401k. So you're actually your paycheck won't go down at all next year. It just won't go up, and it's not even going to happen for a year. So the basal ganglia basically said, I'm not even interested in this decision. Prefrontal cortex, you can do it. Take care of it. It's not going to happen for a year. It's not going to really have an impact. I don't care. And so people were much more likely to invest their future raise in their 401k. And of course, they had the freedom. This is America. That a year later, if they wanted to sign a form to take away that investment, they could. But it didn't happen nearly as much. And so one of the ways that people invest in 401ks is not by investing today's money, but by investing tomorrow's money. And that's total user experience. They didn't change the, what the investments were. They didn't change anything except where they basically where they signed on the dotted line, which is totally in the UX. What is the default? Smart defaults is a, a UX issue. And because people tend to be kind of lazy, which we know, defaults tend to be what people keep for a long time. So another study was, what, what, uh, what form do they need to sign? Let's say you're starting your first job. You're sitting down during open enrollment period or whatever. And they say, OK, you have two different conditions. One is you have to sign up to be in the 401k. The other option is you have to sign up to be out of the 401k. And in one case, people were more likely to be in it. In the other case, people were more likely to be out of it, even though it was only like one little form. Laziness had that much uh, power on us, actually. Um, so what we're trying to do in our user experience design is if we don't do anything with the design, we just leave it the way it is, the chocolate cake wins. Because that part of our brain is just much more powerful. So we need to design the UX to try to overcome that. And that's where UX design comes in on this. So how can we do this? Well, one of the things that we can do is use these smart defaults. Another thing that we can do is use more photos, because it turns out that one of the ways we can get the, um, the uh, basal ganglia and the amygdala to think long term is we can show pictures of what you'll look like long term if you eat that chocolate cake. And it, it, well, unfortunately, it wasn't UX researchers. It was psychology researchers that tend to do a lot of this research. So they do more studies with chocolate cake than with UX designs. I'm definitely in the wrong field. Um, but what they found is that when the amygdala sees this version of you after 200 days in a row of chocolate cake, it starts to get a little worried even now and says, all right, maybe I will get the fruit. So one of the ways that we can actually have the amygdala make the right decision is with photos or more visceral experiences. Even if it's a long-term image that we're giving them now, as long as we're giving it to them now, because it's that instant gratification piece of your brain that we need to, uh, to think most about. OK, now this is actually a um, very, very new finding. Actually, this is a paper that just came out about a week ago. Um, and one of the things that they've discovered is that as you age, your brain transforms. So when we're young, the hippocampus is the part of our brain that's involved in, in memory and learning. It's that good part, the part that makes solid, numerical, quantifiable, cost-benefit decisions. And what it turns out is that when you're young, a big chunk of your hippocampus is dedicated to learning stuff, and a smaller chunk is dedicated to remembering stuff you learned before. And as you age, the neurons actually change their function. So when you're older, more of your brain is good at remembering stuff you've learned before, and less of it is available and good at learning new stuff. I mean, that makes sense logically, again, running around the savanna for 100,000 years, because you know a whole lot of stuff when you're old. So it makes more sense to use things that you've practiced and learned and are good at. And when you're young, you don't know a whole lot even though you think you do. So it makes sense to have a whole lot of neurons ready and available to learn new stuff. But in UX, that's a problem. Because as we get fewer neurons dedicated to learning new stuff, 
we start turning into an old curmudgeon, right? These, I violated some copyright laws to put these images on, but I'll have to apologize for that. These are my favorite curmudgeons. And they don't want to learn new stuff, right? They want to force what they already know onto new situations. And they're the hardest people to design for because they want it to learn to work just like the old one did. I don't care if I've got an iPad 4. I want it to work just like my Apple IIc. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed at that because I would have felt really old if nobody knew what the Apple IIc was. Oops. Oh, there it is. How many of you, when you install the new version of Windows, choose the Windows Classic because you already know how that one works? And the new one, OK, I'll probably learn it eventually. And it'll probably be better because it's newer. And it probably has functionality and all different things. But I don't feel like learning new stuff. I just want it to work the way it does so I can actually get my real job done. I don't want to spend my day learning how to use the new Windows. How many of you actually do that? I actually have Windows Classic on mine, I admit it. And you'll notice there's an age correlation in the show of hands right there. And it's not your fault. Your brain has transformed into being really good at remembering and not as good at learning. And we could either try to fight that or we could design knowing that it's going to happen. So we know that younger users are going to prefer designs that work differently because they like to, new, to learn new things and explore new things. And if it works the same way, they're going to have to remember that. And they don't have as many neurons for that. They have more neurons for learning. Older people are going to want to use the old way of doing things. So they need that crutch. They need to be able to set it on Windows Classic. So what can we do about that? We can use differentiation. We can actually have a version for the old people and a version for the new people. The Windows uh, Classic and the new one. Or we can actually allow them to customize it themselves. Setting, put it on the old one or put it on the new one. Or we could have some features that if you're a young person and you want to learn and explore new things, you can add that to the menu. But if you don't want to be afraid of new things, it doesn't even have to appear on the menu at all. You can actually just make the, the toolbar customizable. Oh, there's a new feature. I'm going to put that on the toolbar so that I can learn how to use it. Or, oh, that's a new thing. I'm going to take that off the toolbar so it doesn't even scare me when I see it. Motivated reframing. This is my favorite one because I am really bad at this. I used to think I was really, really smart. And now I know that I just decide what I want and I've become that old curmudgeon I had a few slides ago. I will force the data to prove to me that I was right, which makes me even more sure that I'm smart, because I'm always right even before I see the data. <laughs> and there have been some fantastic studies proving that. I'm, I'm going to use one political example, since, since Bill had his, um, what was the congressman's name? Uh, Hutchins. Hutchins. Um, you know, gas prices have been going up and down and up and down and up and down. And if you're a professional PhD economist, you'd say that there's very little that the President of the United States or the government could really do about it because it's all supply and demand. Um, but of course, there are other people who say, no, that you can jawbone and you can pound the podium and you can do all kinds of things. You can drill, baby, drill, or you could. I'm not going to get into the actual politics of this. This is just the psychology behind it and how it impacts our UX design. What they did was they asked people when um, uh, George W. Bush was president and gas prices were going up. They said, can presidents have an impact on gas prices? And remarkably, Republicans said, no, it's not George Bush's fault. It's supply and demand. And Democrats said, yeah, it's his fault. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's incompetent. And then they reran the study when Obama was president and gas prices were going up. And sure enough, the Republican said, it's his fault. He's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. And the Democrat said, no, there's nothing he can do. It's supply and demand. And of course, it could be that maybe the world was different. And maybe one of them really was at fault and the other one wasn't. So they actually tested him to see what their background knowledge was on supply and demand and the world oil markets and so forth. And none of them really had a clue. <laughs> so it turned out that the only thing that was causing the difference was what they preferred to be true. 
oops. That's not very good for considering uh, for the future of democracy, right? <laughs> if that's the people who are going to be voting and, they know, and people are so motivated, they just vote for the person that they like better and then force the data to fit that. That's, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to try to answer that question today. Um, now, the wine study is a little bit less scary, so I'll, I'll uh, mention that one, too. In fact, that for, this is, again, I'm in the wrong field. There's a lot of studies that look at wine. Um, taste tests, for some reason. I don't know how that works. Some, some excuse to drink some wine. Um, but in, in one study that is very much relevant to mo this uh, motivated reasoning and reframing, they, uh, it turns out that if you put a couple of drops of a good balsamic vinegar in red wine, it tastes better if you don't know that it's been done. I, I mean, balsamic vinegar is pretty good. And it matches the flavor, right? It just gives it a more earthy tone to it. If any of you are onophiles, you'll kind of know what I mean there. And if you're not, just take my word for it. Um, so what they did was they actually gave people you know, different wines. And they tested about 10 different conditions. But the, the important ones were, one, they put the balsamic vinegar in it, didn't tell them about it, just said, which one do you like better? And it was the same wine, just one had a little vinegar and one didn't. So there was, it was a good comparison. And they, uh, on average, they liked the one with the vinegar in it. Then they said, OK, here's this wine. And here's the same wine with a couple of drops of balsamic vinegar in it. Taste test. Which one do you like better? Oh, definitely this one. Passionately this one. No one would admit that they liked wine with vinegar in it. Nobody. Even people who weren't big wine people didn't want to admit that. And then they also had versions in the middle where they said, OK, drink the two wines. Here's two different wines. Don't say anything yet. This one has, is the same thing, but has a couple of drops of balsamic vinegar in it. So they had already decided in their mind which one they liked better, but they hadn't actually said it out loud. Then they did it again where they said, OK, which one do you like better? This one. OK, that one is the same wine, but with a couple of drops of balsamic vinegar in it. Now you can say it again. Which one do you like? So now they've already said it out loud. Do they want to seem like they're a liar by changing their answer? <laughs> and it turned out that the, the results were all over the place. So then they actually did those fMRI studies. And it turned out that it wasn't just the decision-making part of the brain that changed its mind once you knew the balsamic vinegar was in there. Your taste buds actually got activated differently. Your senses changed, not just your decision-making. That's how fundamental this motivated reframing can be. And um, I'm just about at the end of my time, so I'll close with, um, with just one more uh, story. And this one is on cheating, because this happens with ethical decision making also. And this was done by uh, Dan Ariely, who's uh, one of my favorite behavioral uh, scientists. He just went from MIT down to uh, Duke. And this was a study on cheating. What he did was he had a, a room full of people, such as yourselves, and they answered 10 questions. And they got a dollar for each one they got right. And the questions were set at a level of difficulty so the average person could get four right. So they handed out the questions and they said, bring up your paper. And however many you get right, you get a dollar. And on average, people got four bucks. So then they did it again. And they said, put your, put your, uh, your sheet in this box. You don't have to show it to us. And just tell us how many you got right. The average went up to five or six somehow. People got smarter. Then they had another condition where, OK, put your paper into the shredder, and then come tell me how many you got right. <laughs> and the average somehow went up a little bit more, because now there was no way anyone could get busted. <laughs> but then they did another one, which was even has a little bit more of a surprising finding. They came up with their, they shredded the paper. And they didn't exchange it for dollars. They exchanged it for tokens. So instead of getting $6, they got six tokens. And then they walked 12 feet and exchanged the tokens for dollars. Why does that matter? But the average went up again. People were, if you had to look somebody in the eye and get dollars, you didn't cheat as much as when you looked them in the eye and got tokens. But then you honestly gave them six tokens for $6. So when you actually physically held the money, you were being honest. And when you were lying, you were just getting tokens. And people lied even more. And then they did a whole bunch of studies into trying to, to tease out why that happened. 
So this is what I'll leave you with because this is a lot about that motivated reframing and the next one I was going to talk about which is identity resonance. People really, really care about their own image of themselves. And so what people do is, it wasn't that a lot of people, uh, that most people were honest and a few people cheated and knocked the average off the board. What it was is that everybody can cheat a little bit and still feel like an honest person. But if you cheat a little bit more than that, you start questioning whether you're really a good person or not and you don't cross that line. So what they found out was that everybody cheated a little and you cheated up to the point where you still could feel like an honest person. Oh, I would have got that right, but I didn't have a lot of time. So I'm going to pretend I got it right. <laughs> or I was going to put B, but I changed it to C. So I'm going to just pretend that I really did leave it at B, because I should have kept it at B. I know you're supposed to keep your first answer. So I'm going to count that as right also. And as long as people were able to rationalize these little things, they could treat up, up to that level. But the ones that they really didn't know, even if they shredded their paper, they couldn't lie about that, because then they would have just felt guilty. So it's not about people are cheaters or not cheaters or this or that. It's you have a self-image and that self-image drives what you'll do. And as long as you can still feel good about yourself, you'll cheat up to that point. And this has amazing implications. This is the message I'll leave you with on changing from real cash to digital cash when we're buying things online. If you don't ever see the money, you're more likely to cheat that token finding. And everybody will cheat a little bit. Inlet, but if we can maybe highlight their self-image, photos of, they actually used the Ten Commandments in this study. If people had to remember the Ten Commandments before doing the study, they cheated less. Even if they weren't religious, even if they couldn't remember any of them. Just the fact that they were assigned the task of trying to remember as many of the Ten Commandments as they could made them cheat less. So we can put that into our UX. I mean, your website, you just have a photo of, you know, a, 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 an honest looking person. And that could make people cheat less. Simple. Imagine if we could really make our UXs that much better with such simple, simple interventions. Anyway, that's where I'll leave you with. Thank you. That was really uh, very interesting. Thanks, Mark. And, and for all those you who don't know Mark, he had another 60 slides here, so. Okay. Yeah. We, we could still be here at 2 o'clock. Uh, okay, so what I'd like to do is just open it up for questions. I'm sure there must be, uh, you know, things that uh, we've mentioned, uh, the, two, the two speakers have mentioned, so uh, let's, let's take a question. Go ahead. So on the, on the last uh, presentation, is it, if you're looking for someone to make a rational decision in your website, is it better to shut up, do, do things that shut down their emotional decision and encourage them, such as sign the contract for what we'll do tomorrow, you know, to do the rational thing, or is it better just to figure out what they want emotionally and get them to do it for a different reason that plays on the emotional side? Right. Well, it depends a little on um, what you're selling. And uh, by selling, I don't necessarily mean right. a financial transaction, but what kind of service that you're offering. Oh, I guess turning it on might help. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the used car salesman is you know, the extreme on one side or the infomercial where they have to rely on that emotion because that's the only way they're really going to make a sale. Um, if people really do have the numbers behind them, then trying to minimize the emotion might, might actually be a, a good uh, solution. But most things are going to be somewhere in the middle. So tr at least a understanding what impact both sides are going to have and trying to include both is for most products going to be, or most UXs, going to be the best way of, of trying to get people to make the best decision, especially the one that gives you the sale instead of some competitor down the street. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is actually a question for both of you and kind of a two-parter. Uh, it's First of all, Mark, is, is the brain evolving over time in the way it deals with making these decisions? And for Bill, is there, has there been a progression in how people uh, make uh, decisions on whether something is trustful or not within your studies? And then relating that to business, how often do you suggest that, that developers and, and, and companies reevaluate their, their sites based on these kind of evolving perceptions? Uh, well, in terms of the, the trust, I, I think that um, 
I haven't seen any data from it, but just all the work that we we do on a regular basis, I would be shocked if there was any real um, evolution, you know, like fundamental evolution, because the things that make the elements that make something trustworthy or not are are kind of hardwired. I mean, it's so I, I just don't I don't. I think how it kind of plays out in design certainly might change. But to your second point, I mean, I would strongly recommend um, doing periodic evaluations because any small changes can make a big, big impact. You know, not just from a trust standpoint, but certainly usability and and, and then all the the issues that uh, Mark uh, touched on as well. Um, so the. The actual physical evolution, I think Bill was 100% on that one, it's, it just ta that takes time. And we're not gonna compensate for you know, 100,000 years of evolution and 10 years of having Facebook. <laughs> but there is also cultural and social evolution and those are starting to happen faster and faster as technology cycles are getting smaller and smaller. And so what we can see is that what, in, what creates that um, Pre-attentive trust in 50 milliseconds isn't going to change, most likely, not change very much at least, or very slowly over time. And the ongoing trust where you really do have experience with a person and you've come to know them very well and they're now part of your tribe, that's also has been around for so long that it's probably not going to change very much you know, quickly. But it's the pieces in the middle that actually have a big impact because there used to not be anything like a friend of a friend connection when we were evolving because there were the people in your tribe who were all good and the people who are out of your tribe who are all bad. And that, th those two things became very diametric. And that's one of the reasons why now we have so many stereotypes and things like that. If you're an in-group, you're good. And if you're an out-group, you're bad. And there have actually been lots of um, anthropological and sociological studies which show that we can define our in-groups and out-groups based on just about anything. I'm a Yankees fan, you're a Red Sox fan. I hate you, you're stupid, you don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> and that didn't exist you know, over evolution, but because we define them as an outgroup, they're no good. But now all of a sudden we have the friend of a friend group which we never had before. So that can evolve into our uh, de definitions of trust because it's something that evolution doesn't have an answer for. So now we have to create an answer. So that can become a new thing but not because it's overcoming evolution, but because it didn't exist in evolution. Yeah, just a, a quick comment on the, um, on, uh, the frequency of testing sites. We, we see with our large clients that there's a very strong tendency toward longitudinal testing in complex sites. And some of those studies are, are now uh, basically on a three month cycle. And they're, they're completely planned out and, and they're just part of the business problem. So that I think there's a very significant trend toward tighter longitudinal testing. Uh, and a specific reason is to adjust some of these uh, issues which we now see are important. We, we didn't even think were relevant five years ago. Okay, another question? Yes. So I understand about the individual consumer using a website and making that cash decision, right, or digital, digital cash. Account. What happens when it's an enterprise user who may be spending money at their organization using the site? Or how does the trust factor play in? Well, th there was actually a study on that, um, on that also, where they looked at whether people were willing to, and this is in an enterprise context, if you go into the office, everyone else has gone home, would you take a dime out of petty cash, or 10 bucks out of petty cash, or would you take a $10 box of pencils home? And people were much, much, much more likely to take $10 worth of pencils home than $10 home even though they're stealing $10 from the company either way. But in like a, in like a user experience or a user front end, but let's say a wireless site to buy cell phones, you know, buy cell phones for everybody in your company? I mean, you know, how does that work within their budget? Or, you know, how does that, how does that user feel about the trust of the site? And, you know? Well, I mean, from what I talked about, the tr trust, you know, they're, like I said, there has to be an element of risk, of some, some negative repercussion. And I think the opportunity for negative repercussions with an enterprise application um, is pretty minimal. I mean, uh, maybe um, making the wrong, wrong decision or, uh, but that's gonna be more tied to really kind of the, the usability of it. Um, usually there's, there's a high, high degree of trust 
in enterprise applications because it's already been blessed or validated by the organization. So to me, that it starts to use the design in terms of user experience really starts to shift more towards um, uh, usability and particularly efficiency of use. Yeah. Um, as Charles mentioned earlier, I've done a lot of uh, consulting as well as uh, research. And one of the areas that I used to do a lot in was, is in performance management. How do you get employees to pursue the, inset the objectives that you want them to and maybe spend less time on the other ones? And it turns out there's a whole bunch of different categories of attribute that people focus on. Money is one, obviously. Um, there's also their own um, promotion, uh, their own success within the company. There's also their social life. Sometimes people are willing to give up financial benefits and opportunities for promotion if it makes them get along with their coworkers because then their day-to-day -day life is better, which actually has more of an impact on your overall life than promotion and, and financial benefits do. So how can companies create the employee experience um, so that the employees are putting much more effort and much more consideration into the metrics that the company cares about and maybe less into some of those others. And money is not always the one, sometimes minimizing risk, increasing resilience are more important even to the company than five bucks today. And employees are really good at minimizing risk because that's usually what they're doing for their own cover your behind strategy of, of keeping their own job safe. So, um, so often, doing, uh, choosing whichever choice, whether it's buying the cell phones for the whole, whatever choice will minimize your risk of getting in trouble is what they take. And that's, uh, again, it's a very, very visceral response with a whole bunch of somatic markers in it. And the company can take advantage of that by saying, okay, you know that thing you're doing for yourself? Let's do it for us too and just use exactly that same strategy that you're using, already using for yourself and use it for the company's metrics as well. Another question? Yes. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, I just want to say thanks uh, for the great presentation. Uh, I really liked your conversation you had with the uh, frontal cortex and your amygdala. I really thought that was really interesting. Uh, my, uh, my question is for Bill, um, and it has to deal with trust and you mentioned manipulation and default settings. Um, I'd like to hear you talk about the rub between marketers. You know, I mean, I think marketers are getting it now that manipulation is bad and, and using correct de defaults. It's changing. It's changing slowly. But you know, a, a lot of marketing has been manipulative over the years. And you know, the, like I said, I started to see change, but. <coughs> What can a, a UX strategist talk to a marketer and say, well, if you're doing manipulative, you know, maybe that's not the best way. You know, it's about building relationships, but, you know, and if you get a marketer who fights back at you and says, well, this is not going to go towards our bottom line. What, type of, what kind of conversation can you have in, in, a, in a circumstance like that? Oh, that's a great one. Um, I, I mean, I, I like to at least start the conversation off by talking about, like you said, that relationship in... Who wants to start their relationship off with a lie, ultimately? I mean, it's not a good way to start, right? Um, but being a data person, what I like to do is try to collect data, looking at both short-term and long-term. Yeah, we can increase uh, email subscriptions, you know, by threefold if we make that um, an opt-out and we put it below the fold and use kind of a, um, a light gray text um, a whole bunch of different tricks, right? And the market's like, yes, sounds good. We can meet our numbers, et cetera. But what's that, what's that gonna do long-term? Are those uh, uh, gonna become qualified customers? How are you gonna build um, brand loyalty, repeat usage, and really try to look at kind of the whole user experience and that whole longer-term relationship? And for me, I would say, let, let's get data and try to uh, develop it and how it impacts overall uh, brand perception. Because if I'm starting off with a relationship, and I, if I notice it, I'm like, who are these guys? Who, you know, they're trying to pull a fast one over me. It completely changes. And, you know, like what Mark was saying before about how, you know, that's going to color my perception of that company for a long time. And so see how it correlates to net promoter score. See how, you know, look at, the, look at those other 
benefits. So I, I mean, just like marketing people are data driven, I think UX people need to be as well and look at kind of a whole whole suite of um, metrics around where where we're trying to get at, not just take a kind of a really myopic short term view of it. And in the in the era of social networking, that's actually a it's a swifter resolution of that kind of problem because somebody internal to the company could possibly tweet out what you're doing and then instantaneously around the world everybody now changes their opinion of you from the good guy to the bad guy and it could devastate your company instantaneously and I'm kind of uh, using a little hyperbole there but it has happened the the original tweeter the mini Microsoft uh, guy who was tweeting out some of the things that they were doing and um, and you know after the Coney videos uh, you know, when Coney 2012 came out, it came out really fast that they were all, it was exaggerating and the video was 10 years old and it wasn't legit anymore. And some of the fake um, uh, uh, charities after the, the Haitian um, earthquake and they got tons of money in six months and then all of a sudden they were being indicted because it came out that they were lying. So the cycle time for how long you can get away with that has shrunk to almost nothing. So I think just that, just the fear of being caught has gone up so high that marketers are learning the lesson by no, no, nothing that we've done, but just the, the risk of getting caught has gone up so fast. Yeah, just think of, of, of you know, just grabbing a screenshot of something, tweeting it or putting it on Facebook. It only takes uh, 30 seconds, right? And then they tell two friends and so on and so on. Yeah, actually, uh, that's a great question, Mark. Um, another thing that's happening in the industry in general is to address the question of whether marketing will buy into a significant UX problem is very robust uh, A-B testing. So for example, you can set up, and there are clients who, who we've worked with who have set up studies that have the opt-in, opt-out, A-B, and they track those clients in a CRM system over time, and, they, and you begin to see the actual numbers. So I think more sophisticated A-B testing and using that data to drive marketing decisions is, is a very important trend now. Uh, there was a question, uh, I'm sorry, back there? Yes. Hi. Um, I really loved your, uh, I really loved both of the talks. Um, I'm with them in person, so it wasn't um, But I, I was wondering, if actually, if you guys could share maybe uh, an exact, like a, a specific experience that you might have had with a client that you were working with out in the real world where they, they used the product as bad and they wanted you guys to put like a UX shine on it and just say, I don't know, we can manipulate people because this is really going to sell rather than like, well, you're thinking of one. I'll uh, I'll give you an example, and this is this is not exactly uh, what you just said, because um, why, why don't you repeat the question? Actually, oh, okay. see if you can clarify it's, a little bit. Did, did yeah. a company ever know that they had a bad user interface and want to put a the the fake shine on it? to make the user think that it's better than it really is and take advantage of some of the things that we've talked about without actually changing the, the fundamental design. And so the example I'll share with you, I, I don't know exactly what they're going to choose to do with the results yet. So this way I'm not speaking ill of anybody, which my mom did tell me was a bad thing to do when I was little. And that's my self-image, uh, that what I talked about at the end of my talk. Um, but what we did was we went in for a, a major Fortune, Fortune 10 company and look at their enterprise portal. So this is what they were giving to some of their enterprise users. And um, what they discovered was that there were lots of fundamental, very expensive things that they needed to fix in order to prevent the problem. And they asked us for design changes that could be made to eliminate the problem. Um, not necessarily the fundamental problem, but eliminate the brand impact problem, the, the, the enterprise version of a net promoter score. Um, and they wanted us to keep in mind the expense of various kinds of fixes when making our recommendations. And so I could have interpreted that as saying they want the window dressing that will increase the brand image without actually changing the fundamentals. Or I could have said, well, keeping it in mind doesn't mean ignoring the expensive fixes completely. So I gave them both sets of recommendations and tried to explain why the fundamental fixes were ultimately a better choice, but both of those fixes are possible. And I just gave them the report yesterday, so I have no idea what they're going to do with it. Bill? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so uh, when clients come to us, um, you know, they have a UI, they have a design that almost always 
always needs improvement or always opportunities for improvement. And, and we'll do the research, we'll do the usability testing, um, and we'll deliver recommendations on, on how to improve it. And no client has ever said, um, we only want just the lipstick on the pig. We only just care about, sometimes they've invested a large amount in the visual design, they haven't given much thought to the interaction, to the usability. Um, but it's never happened where they've just, they would, explicitly tell us, like, we, we don't care about the experience, we just want it to look good. Um, but what happens is once you del deliver your recommendations for improvement, then that's kind of where the rubber meets the road to say, yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah, we understand that's an issue, that's an issue, yeah, that's a big one, but we can't do anything about it because of the time, because of the budget, all these other constraints, right? And so it's, it ends up that they just, putting a little bit of lipstick on there without making the fun. That's really the, the crux of the problem. It's, it's, it's more about how you uh, kind of manage that project and the, the whole user-centered design process that kind of gets in the way as opposed to everybody wants something to look good but also work well. You know, they're all, we're all on the kind of the same page, but it's how it gets kind of, um, how it carries out in reality that you end up just tweaking this, tweaking that, you know, and any time you can say, oh, you know what, people didn't understand that term, so change that term to that. Oh, yeah, absolutely, that's easy, and we'll just code that right in, and that's no big deal, but it's, it's the fundamental things around the information architecture or, um, you know, navigate, all that is a, a much more difficult conversation to have. We had a question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, the, the politician example kind of made a point. The guy's in office. Uh, so, you know, we, I guess we have to take, take into example that sometimes there, there are more compelling reasons to choose a certain product or service or that the web is not that relevant to, to that person's marketing. Or uh, are there product services or certain customers who actually respond to what we consider are bad um, design? Yeah, that is, I had the exact same thought when I, uh, just a couple days ago when I found that website, I was like, Astounded. I was astounded. I, I, uh, I'll admit I'm, I'm neither a North Carolina resident nor I'm a Republican. So I was like, wow. This person, it's, it's not like dog catcher. I mean, he's a member of Congress, and how can they have a website like that? So, um, so then I started thinking, yeah, I think, well, you know what? I'm certainly not his target by any stretch. Maybe that's the maybe that's the design that really resonates with people. Maybe that over the top is what his constituency is looking for. But then there are some issues that um, go beyond that that are just pure usability. So whether you're whatever your political leanings, wherever you're from, if you can't read something because of the contrast or because of that font size um, or because of the information density that's a problem no matter what, right? So he, if he can't get his message out, you know, and certainly there's a tone and you could argue maybe that the tone is actually perfect, it's right on target for what he's trying to get across. What about the, what about the diet product? I'm thinking more of there where it's more subtle. But people, <clears throat> people do buy from those sites. Absolutely. It, you know, I, I, again, I think it just goes to really understanding what your, who your audience is and, and and I think that's a perfect example of what Mark was talking about, of, of kind of the short-term, long-term trade-offs and really, you know, re reducing risk. All of it was like, no fees, no fees, hurry up. You know, so many things, things left. And that was a real, trying to be a very much of an impulsive buy. But, um, um, but there's, there's good design that is going to cut across a lot of that because, yeah. And if you can get the motivated reasoning aspect involved, then what you wind up doing is people who already want to believe in you, in, in the case of a p politician or a diet drug, uh, if you think about, um, again, the, the motivated reasoning, I really want to lose weight and I need something to grasp because I've tried Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig and nothing has worked for me. So I want this to work. If I want it to work, therefore it must be real. If it's real, they must have a good website. And if it has a good website, then this design must be good. 
And so it works in a complete backwards path, and all of a sudden that website is a good website in their minds. But that will only work for, in the politician's case, the already converted person. Maybe, maybe that is the target for the website, but maybe not for the TV commercial. So you might wind up having to differentiate your different campaigns so that your website it looks that way on, on purpose because you're trying to target the true believers, whereas your radio ad might, might not. And so you use one strategy for one UX and another strategy for another UX, depending on who's coming. Is it your loyal purchaser on your Facebook page, or is it your um, uh, potential new customer on your website, and then have a totally different design for each? Yes, in the back. Uh, well, in the mobile world, one of the challenges is not getting people to download an app, but getting it to be an app they use once a week, one of those five to ten apps they use frequently. So what's some of the science behind creating habits or repeat music? There's actually a, a whole book that just came out um, about three months ago called The Power of Habit. And um, it, it had actually a, one of those things that's a really, really straightforward and simple to say, but try doing it, it takes a little bit more thought. Um, but what they talk is, what, um, his, his basic point is, is actually, I think, has a lot of truth to it, which is that the things that trigger somebody's behavior are going to be the same no matter what you do. And the end result that they're looking for is going to be the same no matter what you do. So the real trick to becoming part of somebody's habit is to make your product or, or your app, in your case, the thing that helps them get from problem to solution, from starting point to ending point. And so the way you want to either present it or you, you need to make sure that if the triggering point, and he actually talks about an example from a long time ago, how did we get people to start brushing their teeth before that was common? I mean, if you think about you grew up for, you're now 35 years old, you've never brushed your teeth in your life, why would you start now? It just doesn't make any sense, even though to us it seems totally natural. Well, how did they get the entire Western, the entire developed world to brush their teeth twice a day from nothing? I mean, that's an amazing change, whoops, change of habit. Imagine if you could do that with your app, you know, the whole world twice a day. Um, and what he did was he, he found out what was it that, uh, what, what, what was the situation that people wanted to change? And that situation was there regardless of whether toothpaste existed or not. It's that, you know, the dry mouth you get in the morning or something like that. And what was a feeling you might have at the end that people would want to have regardless of whether toothpaste existed or not, which is that clean feeling and fresh and good breath and that kind of stuff. So what he did was he sold, instead of selling the app or the toothpaste, they sold the link between when you have this feeling, brush your teeth, and you'll have this feeling. And so the, the customer didn't think about toothpaste at all. They thought about, I have this feeling, I want this feeling, I need a way to get from here to there. And so that's how they drummed in the habit of brushing your teeth, is it's the way to get from this situation which you already have to this situation which you really want to have that had nothing to do with toothpaste. So they never actually sold toothpaste. They sold the transformation from this situation to that situation. Yes, go ahead. I was wondering, what is the origin of the behavior and the first example, I'm sorry, it's from Mark, or let's answer. The first example that you gave where the client doesn't know what they want, even though they asked for it, and they're not satisfied once they get what they asked for, and even when you show them proof that it's something that they asked for, they still almost blame the developer. What is the origin of this behavior and what can, if anything, can be done about this? Well, it starts out as being kind of the motivated reasoning um, issue. What happens is they, they know what they want to get, you know, the, the clean feeling after brushing your teeth. Um, they don't know anything about fluoride and they don't know anything about mint toothpaste versus cinnamon toothpaste. So what they do is they say, well, I know that this is the end result I want. And I'm gonna use my knowledge to figure out what, should, what would get me there. And so I'm gonna tell you that's what you should give me. The problem is they're coming from a situation where they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. So if you let them tell you what, the, what should be in their toothpaste, it's gonna be wrong. So what you have to do is you have to think about what is the feeling that they wanna get after the toothpaste and then use your own, use, use your experience knowledge to figure out the best way to get them there instead of actually listening to what they say. 
So when you're listening to what they say, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying listen to what the end result that they're looking for is, not the path, because they will give you the wrong path every time. And, and, and to the extent that you can let them realize that will make it all the more effective. So if they say, oh, you, you know, uh, you make a good point, or if you're giving these uh, hints, whether subtle or not, about what that right path is, and they can start to uh, realize it and, and come to it on their own and start to own that, then you're golden. Then, then you know, everything should be good. You know, so it's it's um, it's a delicate conversation, but it can it can definitely happen. Yes. When you do the research and you ask the question, do you trust? Is it in a binary thing? Yes, no, or is it a degree from zero to five? Um, in the the study that that I presented uh, this morning, um, it was on a, a, a five point scale, so from uh, high. To High, high to low trustworthiness, yeah. Right. In general, with, with something like trust, you can't use much more than five because it's just not that sensitive uh, a concept in people's minds. Do I trust you uh, a 12 or a 15? It, 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 just, it gets really, really blurry. But two is not enough because it isn't just I trust you or I don't. There are, well, I trust you with unimportant things, but I wouldn't trust you with really important things. So five tends to work pretty well. In, in the video that I showed of, of the face and how the face changed, right? you can see some level of gradation. Um, I don't know if you saw it when it was moving down to zero. It looks just plain face. you know, And, and, and you definitely can see some, some continuum. Just one, one sec. Any, anybody else have a question? Yes, in back. How many, um, so even if you download an app and say you have a problem that needs solved, and this app is like, you know, in, this, in, the, in the past solved all your problems, and then you have a bad experience with that app, you know, does that break that habit of going to that app? Like, how many bad experiences, or how many good experiences does it take to outweigh a bad? I think it really depends on what the good and the bad are. I mean, there's there's bad experiences where uh, might be minor, right? Where you the the data is out of date, or you have to re-enter something. It's it's a nuisance, right? But then there's something that could be um, malicious, or or I think that is basically a one-shot deal. I think once you cross, it's kind of like that. You just kind of once you cross that line. You know, it's really, really tough um, to get that back. And I know that they're also very culturally sensitive, too. I think generally Americans are more forgiving, uh, especially in the data that we've looked at. Um, and it's, but I, I think that, you know, it, if, if you can say, well, you know, it, it could have been a, a bad experience because of the technology or the, their back end server, the, the server was down or, um, or just a bad design, but they meant well. Very, very, it pretty easy, maybe two or three times over a longer period of time, but it's, it's hard to do that trade off without knowing really the context of it. I'll give you one, um, so, something that gets very, very fundamental to, to the way the brain works, which, which helps to solve that problem, which is the self-identity that I talked about earlier. If you can get your brand into their concept of self-identity, then they'll be much more forgiving for your mistakes. So if, you're, if you don't buy Apple because they happen to have functionality that you like, but you buy Apple because you want to be an Apple guy, mm -hmm. then they can screw up a whole lot. And it's, as long as other people don't start thinking about Apple differently, it's not gonna change your behavior because you don't buy Apple because of the way it treats you. It, you buy Apple because the way you look with, in front of your peers by having one. And so that gives you a lot more. And so what that changes is called the attribution of um, responsibility, which is, um, and this kind of gets at what, at what Bill was saying, you have a choice when there's a failure. Do you blame the company because they did it either on purpose or out of negligence? Or do you blame something that was outside their locus of control? And it's, you, don't, you don't make that attribution based on what's real. You, base, you make that attribution based on what you'd like it to be. 
So if I like Apple, then anytime they screw up, I'm going to say, well, that was, some, that was an outlier. It's not their fault. It was because of AT&T's network, not because of Apple. It was because of my dog, you know, bit it or, you know, something like that. We will blame somebody else because we don't want to blame the brand that we like. So if you can get your brand into, into your customer's feeling of self-identity rather than just you have a good product, you're much more robust to those kind of problems. Doing it is a little harder. <laughs> My users, here's a list of the features that we put. Uh, here's a list of the features that I put into the design. And I want to ask them uh, which is the least favorable for you and which is the most favorable for you. If I would ask this question to my, uh, my users, would, the, would there be any disadvantage of asking these questions or not? I mean, I understand that it can be favorable to me to know this information. What do they like the most? What do they don't like the most? But how it could affect me? It's possible to ask a question having absolutely no interest in the answer, but because the process of answering the question gets the customer to take on a particular viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And if you only have 10 people in a room, that's not going to change your market share all that much. Um, but if you have a broad-based survey where you're asking you know, 20,000 people a particular question, just having the opportunity to answer the question can change your brand image. That's actually what a lot of customer survey, uh, customer comment cards, and those kinds of things, uh, that's why companies do them. They don't do them because they really want to know the answer. They do them because having the opportunity to vent <laughs> makes you feel better as a customer. You think that the company cares about what you think, so all of a sudden you like them more, so you're not going to switch, even though they might have just thrown away the customer comment cards and never actually looked at them. Or if you really do like them and you said it out loud, as, as with my wine example, um, then in order to maintain that self-identity, you don't want to be a liar. So if I tell the world that I like this company, I better keep using them. Otherwise, I'll be a liar and I don't want to seem like a liar in front of my peers. So it's possible to do that. Um, whether that's a good thing to do or not, an ethical thing to do or not, a long-term thing to do or not, that I'm not sure we really know. I have my suspicions. Um, but it definitely works in the short term. I, I would just add, there's always, a, there's always a downside or a risk. And the risk is that you misinterpret the data. You know, writing good surveys is truly an art and a science. And you really have to know what you're doing, otherwise you'll misinterpret the data. And so you could ask, here's a laundry list of all the different features, some that we have, some that we don't. Check all the ones that you want or rate usefulness. Or, um, and people might not understand what those are, misinterpret those. Oh my god, yes, absolutely. You've got something else in mind than what they have, right? So all of a sudden you start building the thing that people really don't want or expect something differently. Or um, it kind of in a classic uh, kind of urban myth around focus groups when people were doing focus groups about uh, um, um, uh, Sony like boom boxes or something way back when and and they were asking all these different features about what you wanted in the boom box and one of them was about the color and everybody said um, you know we want all these different colors and they said okay focus groups over now is compensation you can each choose out uh, take a boom box home with you every single person took black Right? <laughs> what they tell you and what their behavior is could be different. So, um, what they say that they want and what they actually need or will use um, is not always a perfect correlation. So, that's another risk that you run into. Okay, one final question? Yes. Uh, I know these sites have uh, an animation explaining what the site is about. Uh, is there a trust factor? I mean, uh, is there any study which shows that that site has an increased trust attached to it? And also, is the color blue more trusted? Oh, gosh. Uh, there is data for blue. I will well, give you that one. There you go. So almost every site seems to be blue, like Facebook, Twitter. <laughs> yeah, and that there, but it's not, it's not a universal truth, but they like to read a book and find out that blue implies trust and use it because it's easier to assume it's a universal trust than to actually do your own research. 
So it, there's a, there is a small effect for blue, but I think they're probably overusing it as a tool. If you want to answer the first one. Um, so the first one was, oh, animation. animation. Uh, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the research, but I, I just know from all the testing that we do in our lab with clients that um, it's very easy to overuse animation because we do eye tracking too. And we see time and time again, you, you have to look at animation so it's effective in terms of uh, drawing, drawing attention. But it, it can, it's, it's a slippery slope that can be uh, overused. There has to be some, um, it has to be done in a very um, modest way. Um, and also something that you can, as a user, you can control to a certain extent. And also, um, it can't be completely gratuitous. Just flashing, just just notice me. There has to be some some type of value behind the level of animation. Okay, that concludes for today. I want to thank Bill and Mark. Great presentations. Thank you very much. And uh, one final reminder: come to our next section. Thanks very much. Have a good day.